Welcome back, everyone, to Vox Markets. My name is Paul Hill, and by popular demand, I am delighted again to be able to speak to Richard Staveley of Rockwood Strategic, one of the UK's finest investors. So welcome, uh, Richard. Thank you very much, Paul. Great to see you again. Yeah, well, I say a lot's been happening since uh, we last spoke sort of six months ago. Uh, we've now got inflation cooling and the central banks have indicated that uh, interest rates over in the States and probably in the UK are, are on hold. So given all that, what's your sort of like your outlook for equities for 2024 as we come into the new year and the uh, in Christmas period? Yeah, well, I think we've got reasons to be a bit more uh, upbeat, actually. Uh, and the market's kind of telling you that in the last couple of weeks. I remember every other time we've had a market low, everyone only realises it was the market low until about a month afterwards. And it's possible we might even be in that phase right now, but I'm not going to pin my colours to the mast to that. Um, and why that is, is because it does look like inflation is clearly coming down, which is great, because markets for us, or the way I see markets, it's all about the interest rate, the rate cycle, always has been, or always, always will be. And, uh, and that reduction in, in, in inflation that we're seeing both uh, indicated both in the States and, and the UK and Europe would suggest that um, interest rates are, aren't needed to go you know, much higher or higher at all. And in fact, probably are peaking. Now, it feels a little bit as if people are maybe still immediately gone for the, oh, well, that means they're coming down again in three to six months. But I think it's so important the, invest, uh, the central banks know that they have to make sure we properly douse uh, in inflation so i think we probably will have the end of the interest rate cycle during during next year at, at, at some point the the point where that just slightly um uh, caution everyone is is that um that the full effect of the rate increases we've had this year are, st are still to fully play out and i don't know about you paul but i know at least three or four uh friends uh who who haven't yet had their um, mortgage rates um, reset uh, on on their variable rate mortgages, but are definitely rather concerned about what that might mean, even you know at, at current interest interest rates, and that's still got to play play through a bit. So we we, we shouldn't get too excited about the end, e environment in terms of end end economics. Mm. That said, um, two thousand and nine forever etched in my brain uh and um and along with a couple of other interesting cycles but that one in particular because if you look at the numis index since 1955 which for your listeners that don't know it's the bottom 10 percent of the uk market by small caps there are essentially been 14 uh, negative uh years uh, since 1955 which is quite exciting because that means we're nearly 70 years in and only 14 of them were down years if you're invested yeah. in small in small cap if you look in those 14 years there are actually three double year episodes uh, 73 74 uh 2001 2002 and yes 2007 2008 and the worst year was always the second year of the two um but there hasn't been a third and 2009 was a year where the market um, um, troughs, um, depending on which index you look at, and kind of March, April. And, and then it was absolutely massive, the 2009 rally. Small cap led value and recovery stocks led like Rockwood's, what Rockwood's most exposed to. The point I'm set, the point I want to just make to everyone is, is that when that um when that when that starts to turn it's too it's it's too late so you need to be positioned before that mm. but equally the recession actually lasted all the way through 09 so the real world was really hurting through 2009 but every, but stock market participants were starting to to smile whereas the, when the real world was was still really quite quite horrible so i think we're moving into that phase for 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 both markets and economies where we're definitely far closer to the end than the beginning we may even have had the bottom uh, but it's more likely we just get um, a little bit more clarity that inflation's broken, interest rates can definitively start to improve. That won't be nice for economies, and then the market should be, should should move away. Uh, I couch all of that in my always comment I say to you, Paul, is that Rockwood, I specifically don't feel as if I'm very good at predicting markets, which is why Rockwood is all about stock picking. So, so we're, we're positioned irrespective of what markets do within Rockwood at the moment. Well, you, uh, don't be so modest. Your, your actual record speaks for itself. I think you're sort of top of the charts in the investment trust space for the last one year, three years and five years. So uh, you can give yourself a little sort of pat on the back. Well, I will anyway. Um, but um, <clears throat> you raise a really good point in terms of the stock market is not actually the economy and, and small 
small caps when you cast your arm back that to 2009 actually bottomed i think it was october 2008 so they were they were six months before the sort of big caps that's all good stuff yeah we like it now in terms of interest rates what's happened over the last year and and you've i think sort of like um done quite a lot of the heavy lifting for certain companies and stuff is that the the debt market is polarized we've had the we've had credit spreads for big caps for bond securities quite narrow which is reflecting they've got money from non-traditional banks from the insurance companies and they've been able to get that that lending and they haven't had to roll over the debt either but small cap world they rely on the banks and the banks have been actually reducing their borrowing because of every, all the deposits have been going into money market funds. So they haven't done as much money. So they've been, liquidity has been sucked out of that small cap sector. That, so you've got this real sort of like bipolarization between extreme lending and cost of capital problems at small caps, but but less so at the, at the, at the big cap. And, and, in, and I've seen sort of like, you know, 10, 15 or 10, 12%, you know, convertible debt in, in small caps. So, so to me, that is going to be the the trigger and and it's what what do you see in terms of triggering the cost of capital for small caps to come down did despite what interest rates do because we need more money coming back into fund managers so they can actually do some of the heavy lifting or for banks to actually do some of the heavy lifting yeah it's it's a very good analysis paul you're 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 absolutely spot on if it wasn't for other things that are grabbing our headlines from nigel farage in the jungle or whatever (laughs) reality is is that the 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 headline should say credit crisis in uk i mean there is literally a credit crisis going on in the uk there is that these mainstream banks are retrenching like ever before you know the old phrase about you know they always Lend, give you a bloody umbrella when it's not raining, but mm. if it is, they won't lend you one. I mean, that's that's what's going on going on now. They the banks uh, do need to. I think it's very difficult for the mainstream banks to get out of that that mentality at the moment. But for for but two things might happen, or would it would be good to happen. Firstly, I do believe in capitalism. I do believe there is a way, and you've just referenced even then some some rates of return on lending money that would suggest that capital might be interested in lending that money. So the the equivalent of the shadow banking sector, which is far bigger in America, has been a critical part of their entrepreneurial and business uh, kind of investing stack from mainstream banks down to uh, angel angel investing. It may be that these kind of returns uh, start start a process of maybe cr- um, creating more flows and private capital into lending to smaller companies. I mean, and and second and secondly, I do think that money will start to flow back into UK um, small companies, definitely in public in public markets. There is some elements of structural, but everyone sort of at this point in the cycle, everyone always goes fully structural in their mindset and thinks it's game over. When actually, what you've got is a sort of overlay of quite a lot of cyclical over a bit of structural. So I think in terms of um, sort of interest in UK smaller companies, so I think money will come back. Now there are some initiatives coming on, and I actually was a signatory to the letter to the times uh last week which was about a british isa we'll find out whether jeremy hunt's going to do anything about that or otherwise but i think there is an opportunity for government support um british isas it c- could easily be a good way of forcing people to have more uk exposure within their equities for the equivalent of a uk offered tax break i mean it seems pretty unfair to give tax breaks for people to buy nvidia shares isn't it <laughs> i mean so so like that that idea i quite like there's one i personally have it hasn't um, it hasn't been as much, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't do some sort of scheme around uh, no CGT for investing mm-hmm. in UK small caps, but with a forced sort of recycling mechanism somehow about either holding periods or through tax years once you've held it a period of time. So you're not just sort of hiding your money in in a, in a fever tree after it's clearly doesn't need your money anymore and it's been around a few years for it for for tax for tax purposes but something like that could be uh could, could be interesting um just to finish on this um it does take people like us to actually do something about it so mm-hmm. um actually it was announced only uh, uh last week that for instance one of our uh top holdings pressure technologies we've actually offered them a uh and they've accepted a loan which um it's a bridging loan, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, essentially, that's what I'm calling it, a bridging yeah. loan. I don't want to get 
um, stuck in the debt long term. I want to have a proper return for Rockwood shareholders whilst I'm holding it. We've worked with uh, Peter Gillahammer, uh, the famous uh, private investor, who's also taken half half the lending, and we've done that at fourteen and a quarter percent, um, which is about is about right, frankly, uh, at the moment. But we've had to step in because. Lloyds Bank, who are their bank for many uh, for many years, have just gone. No, actually, you know, we just want to move on. We want to move on now. And you know, pressure tax. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been around for over a hundred years. It employs lots of people in the northwest. We're not doing this for charity. It's fair to say, but but the reality is is that it's a one of the it's a leading global manufacturer in the submarine market. And actually, ha- it's continuing to help build our new nuclear sub- submarines, which is all about in all our interests so i think there is a role it does gas cylinders doesn't it does two divisions it's got sort of like uh it's uh was it chesterfield special cylinders business that does sort of like help submarines with their gas canisters and to be able to buoyancy i guess and well and it's, then... it's both the actual yeah so yeah yeah so chesterfield's been around for many years has sales of on a, on a bad year 18 million in a good year recent years 22 22 million quid it has uh Three end markets really. These cylinders um, are uh, they're actually for the the missile. Um, um, well, are they actually yeah, launchers? Yeah, yeah, and the oxygen systems and, the, okay. and some of the buoyancy as well. But they are they're all in all of those all three. Um, and uh, but they also do those canisters into ejection seats for um, fighter jets and um, and a number of other small defence. It's a real specialisation that is. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's high and, value. Yeah, and then they do all the ones for BOC um, and have other industrial applications. Now, it's not just anything. What's great is is because very few people can actually do what they do. The quality is required. Uh, they're, they're, we're selling these things even to the blooming French Navy, uh, the Taiwanese Navy, uh, Taiwanese the sub submarines. For your listeners that don't know, is actually a growth market. It is. It's uh, massive. It's great. I mean, the, the official stats are that it's growing at four point four percent a year the last few few yeah. years. They say double G, GDP, but we're we're pretty sure there's a few little submarines that aren't included in that. That maybe people are making. There's an enormous more. fleet being built by Australia, isn't it? The Oz New Zealand one, and we're supplying some of the equipment in. I think that that's right, and indeed, you know, we would be, you know, fingers crossed at pressure technologies they they're likely to um you know they'd, they'd like to be winning work on that and um you never know we might hear work hear news on that on that soon it's called the orcas program that's it um um but they also what's the other piece is they also are in hydrogen so um very quietly um particularly quietly because quite rightly they they didn't want to sort of over press it they weren't quite sure and there's been a lot of full storms in a renewable energy mar- markets but the hydrogen sales at, at pressure tech of these cylinders have been growing over the last few years and they're quite quite a lip from a very small small base and it, it's feeling um well the, the evidence would suggest and the pipeline of prof- prospects would suggest that that it's a real thing now that the the in, and what they're f- focused on is essentially refueling for the hyd- emergent hydrogen economy so, so let's say you switch the whole of a city to uh, hydrogen based buses and all that sort of stuff then they'll have refueling plants and and you have static storage um uh, i think um uh, requirements and pressure tech cylinders are you know are very very high spec so they could potentially be in there they're also they've got these aspirations pressure tech to develop and they do a bit to a bit of it already they work with Bab- babcock they in in um the in actually test then checking everything's working which is yeah. nice business you know you know send a chap in call cup and the services in, side in, in, uh, in yeah that's quite a high multiple business bringing that all together market cap is about 11 million quid at pressure technologies yeah uh, the other division you mentioned does is up for sale it's it's an oil and gas isn't it? it's precision machine um parts i think it is isn't uh, it that's right they they basically have a they have the roster of um oil and gas customers i mean it's literally it's like the beatles they've got like um you know it's baker hughes schumberger x bro they absolutely you know they, they're all they're all there and they're those guys have been very quiet for the last few years the cycle is clearly on the on the up most people don't care in, in stock markets anymore because and like half half the fund management told them not yeah. to buy an oil and gas company again so they don't bother reading the news about oil as much as they should do but basically the services thing is is on the is is on the is on the build 
and that company that that division has been put up for sale we you know we, we'd like we we think there is that there will be value which will then pay back the loan that we mm. the bridging loan leave them some extra money over and then the business can focus entirely on chesterfield's prospects going forward now mm. i don't know about you paul but if the i think if you look in the accounts if you I don't know if you have but if, if if anyone looked in the accounts for chesterfield you'll see that the divisional profitability of chesterfield over the years has been really quite good mm. um you know t- teens level of, of of margin or prof- profitability and so like you know um 20 million of sales on low teens profit profitability as i've just mentioned the market cap's 12 so you know there's quite a lot of value hidden there and of course there is because it's 12 million quid so everyone's forgotten about it exists it's quite it's quite well owned actually in the private investor community community yeah. and i'm sure any of your listeners that own it will just be cursing and swearing and thank god they're they're <laughs> they're on mute um it's been quite a journey pressure tech to this point but um the, the the long and short of it which i hope your shareholders can see is that in the last six months we, Harwood, and I have, you know, rolled up our sleeves. I mean, we've rolled them up so far, I'm almost wearing a tank top. It's basically, we, you know, we've gone on the board, we're giving them money, we're getting things sorted out, and hopefully we'll make, we'll, 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 we'll um, yeah. un- unlock some shareholder value over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, well, you managed to do that, didn't you, with a similar sort of like movie with uh, with Kreschik, which was also sort of spun off its um, oil and gas business and then concentrated on renewables. So uh, you, you've got a good one. And and before you sort of like, you know, crack open the uh, yellow submarine uh, on, on, on pressure, pressure tech, what's your sort of valuation would you put on this business? Because because I'm with you, this huge intrinsic value here, if they can actually pull that successful sort of unbundling opportunity and then use that sort of submarine defense hydrogen as that investment platform yeah um it's actually a little bit of a tricky question for me to answer from a regulatory and responsibility yeah okay fine because i'm on the board yeah okay it's public information that prior to me going onto the board i've said that the oil and gas business uh, I mean, it's the widest bid off for spread you'll see this week, uh, Paul, but, but I said that was worth between three and 10 million pounds. Yeah, okay. Okay. And that was before uh, the cycle right. had started improving. Yeah, okay. So, so, um, so pressure tech, um, you know, um, we, we, I would, I would suggest that um, one of my rules of investing, which might be helpful for some, mm-hmm. some listeners is there's a very high um, magnetic uh, force which draws the valuation of stocks um, to their operating margin, their sustainable operating margin in their EV to sales ratio. So what yeah, this means clearly agreed. is that if you're a 10% margin business and you it's think one, you one time that, sales, it's one time sales. Yeah, yeah. It's too simple for good, but Warren Buffett no. speaks, does talk a lot about agreed, agreed. So, so I would say, as I was saying earlier, and trying to quietly imply, um, the Chesterfield business has, you know, has yeah. historically might grow more, but it has been doing maybe 20 plus million of sales and maybe makes more than 10% margins. So. Okay, well, I'll just give investors a bit of an indication on that one. If it's 20 million of sales on a one time sales, that's 20 million with roughly around about just less than 40 million of um, of shares. So that's well, basically 50 per share, isn't it? It's just it's just on that's just on for the uh, the submarine business or effectively for the cylinder business. OK, right. Good. <laughs> I could do the maths. Now, another one when you've been uh, well, you may need to do a bit of heavy lifting is um, our Gentex, because I know you've got not a big position in this one at all. And you haven't that because it's got a really strong balance sheet. It's got it's got tons of cash and stuff like that. But uh, the CEO and the CFO have m- sort of mysteriously left. Uh, we've had a new chairman came in about, I don't know, three or four months ago. A guy called Nigel Railton, I think he's from Camelot, and now we've got a new interim CEO, Jim Ormond. How, that these guys do sort of like their traditional sort of forex trading business, but put, of expanding abroad and of, of put a, a technology platform. What's your sort of latest on this one? Yes, so it's been a li- has been a little bit frustrating in terms of what the short term share price behaviour has been of late. And the only bit in that that um, is kind of justified is that they have, as part of these changes, slightly brought back uh, numbers. Not not hugely, and the year isn't out yet. But around these changes, mm. they've also brought back uh, brought yeah. back numbers a bit. I think what's what's slight, what's been frustrating, but it's not it's not completely unexplainable. Is is that they've uh, the, the changes that have been happening. They the guys that were the guys that were involved 
how that aren't public markets guys, mm. the new guys as well. And and also some of the changes have been happening. Um, they've sort of decided to just get on with them and then sort of communicate with the market later. And in a kind of in a perfect world, you, it, it could have all been explained um, more 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 openly or maybe more clear more clearly. And not everything that's happened has happened in the order that I think. Uh, the board expected it to that all sounds slightly weird what are you talking about Richard but yeah it does it does <laughs> the, the truth is 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 that um, our Gentex had three founders yeah um the the one of them left some quite some time ago uh the second one left about two years ago um and the third and the third uh, Harry became CEO after the second one uh, second one had, uh, had left and what's happened is that Harry, the third founder, uh, the youngest of the three, um, uh, uh, has left the business uh, not long after there's been an evolution of the board. Now, Nigel has gone in, is a force of nature, and I would, um, if he's, you know, you might get an interview with him, but I'm not sure, Paul, but he, because he's a busy man, but he, yeah. Nigel was um, um, very senior at, at Camelot, run a bit which is a huge huge enterprise and i think he as the new chair new fresh pair, pair of eyes has essentially you know um assessed the state of the business in terms of its the its management team uh the the uh how uh, well thought through and um the strategy is actually uh in terms of having a really proper commercial strategy for the business and i think has started to make the changes that he thinks is necessary to achieve what our gen techs can achieve and you get this so often in small cap you get three really bright entrepreneurial people that build a business very successfully have done a great job get it to a certain point it then lists or gets sold but in this instance it sort of got list and then the next phase often requires a different set of people or a different set of kind of qualities or characteristics to really take the business on to the next to, to the next to the next stage it's often very emotional you you can imagine you know i've conversations with all the individuals you, you've mentioned and i've mentioned or already uh because you know often founders you know feel very very passionate well they do feel very passionate about what they've created but so what that's a long-winded way, frankly, of saying that our Gentex board is, evol is evolving run, uh, via a very, very experienced uh, in, our, in our chair. And um, the exec team is now evolving as a result of that. The business itself is despite is going to do 15 million of profit this year, at yeah. least. That's what they've just said. So this is a very, this is one of the most... They've only EBIT, got EBITDA, about, isn't it? 15 million, 15 million EBITDA. EBITDA. But it pretty much all goes into cash because the it is yeah. in, interest income. Yeah. yeah? Uh, they don't, they're not, they're not have huge amounts of capex, but on tech, but it's not huge. You know, it's a very cash generate, very cash generative uh, to business. And, you know, they, um, and, and this is the point, it's only got just over, I mean, how many companies do you follow, Paul, which mm. have got 110 employees and make 15 million quid EBITDA? I mean, it's this this yeah, is a really attractive business. And what, what 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 often you find in life is that the really attractive businesses have super niches, you know. Mm. But this is the, they're a disruptive uh, business that could, that's taking on potentially banks everywhere. I mean, the moment the UK, they're up to just over 1500 corporate clients, mm -hmm. uh, very sticky clients like what they do, where they're providing a much better service than the bulge bracket bank bank. Yeah. They're they're doing it at a much cheaper cost, so they get they get a the, the clients get both a better deal and better service. They're, as a result, they're sticking and growing. Uh, it's been growing for years throughout throughout all of this. They obviously they're, they're lapping. I think part of this is they're lapping a bit of a big bonus last year from um, yeah. Miss Truss, who's about the only person that benefited from it. But yeah, the, okay, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the LDI the, crisis. September. Yeah, and there was a load of FX, huge yeah. amount of FX volatility and stuff done around that, which created a bit of a sort of one off amounts of volatility um but they, the reality is is that they have there's a there's, there's there's a number of additional products which they're developing or could do to add to their sort of um mainstream type fx solutions they give to their clients equally they they they've they've now licensed in the netherlands but there's fx requirements all over europe and they're waiting for a um a, a sign off in australia it's fair to say i think the the changing of a ceo actually delays that because you have to like re-sign the yeah, ceo okay. of the stuff but that but um so the business is highly profitable it's got a huge potential growth over the long term 
it's going through a kind of um you know it's cadre change which mm -hmm. injecting more maybe more professionalism or a different you know a different style of uh of leadership to how you execute on that bigger bigger market and you know hidden in the corner of this discussion is this the doyen of mid cap um small cap managers uh and the small cap managers that own it even though it's huge mm. uh called alpha fx yeah. which is the without a doubt the one that's really sort of done it uh a very very profitable grown but not 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 you know not miles dissimilar mm. to what our gentex does you know a lot a lot of uh similar products um not dissimilar growth rates uh, our alpha's got a lot of more size a lot more size and as a result the stock market likes it more because of its size and also that scale allowed it to produce higher operating margins but mm. you know we, we would expect our gentex's operating margins to over the next few years get up to at least 30 yeah. percent and really they should be targeting 40 percent longer term we think the growth rate could be so this 15 million is on i think about 50 Five million of sales, something like that. that yeah, right? 50 million of sales. Yeah. About fifty I mean, million of sales. I mean, this is sort of one. If the, this is, you know, it's one of the old, um, you know, if there's a Christmas present where you sort of stick it in the, yeah. you know, you, you know, you stick it in the back drawer and just cut. Yeah. You be, be, it's one of the companies I'd be least wor worried about in five years' time. You come back and go, oh, it's it's actually yeah. twice the size and it's making yeah. thirty million of profit. And now it's making thirty million. It's a bit bigger and and people and they've sort of um, given some consistent delivery. So we'll put it on the same or a near evaluation to alpha fx mm -hmm. in which case the market cap could be 400 500 million yeah yeah no i would agree and it trades i mean just dealing with current price it trades about four and a half times ebitda and about eight yeah. times pe so yeah it looks totally mispriced to me and i know the shares have fallen out of bed but the business hasn't importantly and it's just yeah. got that it's, it's a solid business and it, it just yeah. needs to say reset and change the uh change i mean the like, i can i can't i don't mind Telling we don't really like talking about recent trading, but it's fair to say I I we've added to our position in the recent mm -hmm. after the recent week after the recent weakness. So well, yeah, I'm not some yeah. <laughs> Take the opportunity, no doubt about it. Now another one which is um, James Fisher, basically it's just sort of like a marine services business that does uh, sort of for oil and gas, but for defence as well. Um, and um, I think it does uh, it does something else as well, another division as well. But um, it's a sort of specialist. It's got quite a bit of debt. How do you sort of like you view James Fisher and also sort of reducing that debt? Because I think it's it's just less than three times EBITDA, which is in this market with the, the cost of financing is 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 relatively high. It's not. It's yeah. It's it's definitely. It is definitely high. It's not. It's not any relative. It's actually absolutely. <laughs> okay. high, uh, I'd say, um, but um, it needs to be seen in the right context for this business. James Fisher, not dissimilar to quite a few stocks in Rockwood's portfolio, mm. has been around for a long time. We we yeah, like stocks that have been around for a long time because we've got loads more evidence to judge what they mm. how they behave through different cycles, what levels of profitability they. They can do it's the ones that haven't been around for long where you're not quite where you're sort of believing in where they might be but you've got to sort of have the crystal ball whereas you know the old ones now james fish has sort of um been around for 175 years paul it's <laughs> okay it's been, it's been around for a long time uh and they are they're in marine energy and defense it, yeah. it's primarily a services business as but if there is some manufacturing in there but services and manufacturing into kind of these specialist niches and um, I mean, believe it or not, it, even though the market cap is now probably about 135 million today, yeah. um, it, it's in it's got over 2000 employees um, and it's in 18 countries. Mm -hmm. And um, last year they did EBITDA of about 65 million quid, I think. Yeah, the yeah. Head, uh, six million. We <laughs> think they can do 85 million uh, of EBITDA. And that's actually not a big stretch from 65. Mm -hmm million of EBITDA uh, and why that's important is because um, um, what's happened is the previous management team as usual uh, in these such companies they've got a fantastic set of businesses that generates loads of cash and generated high returns on capital and all of a sudden at some point in your history some guys take over and get carried away don't they and buy lots of businesses that aren't quite as good for the wrong price splurge all the money uh, jack up the the debt and you know they look very clever for a little bit and then it all goes wrong well they've all been fired 
So um, Jean Vernet's gone in. Jean is, not, is a really good operator. He was a um, managing director of one of the divisions at Smith's PLC. For oh, okay. He ran the John Crane business. But he's also, in his prior to that, done a range of really serious positions glo- globally in, interestingly, both marine and energy uh, uh, bus- um, um, sector, sectors. So he's got, he's got a, 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 almost a perfect CV, CV for the, for this job he's gone in i love french um, management teams when they're um, not running french businesses they they're always the guys that get the french guy commercial guys that go abroad there's almost a you know it's like a sort of 8 out of 10 hit rate that they they're, they're very very good and dynamic managers and jean jean is definitely uh, one of those he's he's immediately um taken it uh, fisher down to these three three divisions and what he said is we're now making 5% margins we should be able to make 10 I mean, it's really not. I mean, it's 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 not a big ask. Is that uh, through from simplification, taking out cost, and just becoming more streamlined? Mick, it's gonna... Taking out cost, removing loss makers, um, um, and and then improving improving pricing uh, and getting in some some businesses it will be being it be scale and also product development with higher margin products in certain certain areas. When you break it down, the defense business is the most interesting one mm. for Delta back to 10, because that was actually loss making last year. And we've been doing some serious like DD on the defense uh, business. Now, the defense business, it does the pictures on the website. It, it, you know, it's really it's 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 sort of commando stuff. So they're doing um, breathing apparatus and uh, diving equipment for the world's special forces and mm. and also like high end naval uh, um, submarine rescue all that sort of uh, all that sort of thing. And they um, they they in there they make um, submarine rescue vessels which cl- which which come up between thirty and sixty million uh, a shot. Uh, they're basically the market leader by some uh, some way, and that division's been has had a sort of trough of lack of orders mm. uh, n- n- nothing to do with they just just that just haven't been the orders for them but they've got a very strong pipeline that in yeah. itself if they win one even one of those would make quite a big difference to the defense mm. business that agree that's consistent with the pressure tech isn't it you're talking about that some sub- submarine businesses really, the whole industry's taken off yeah yes it is i think they're more these guys are more um yeah no it is linked to that but they're also linked to special forces because yeah. what they've got so i went to uh, the defense exhibition uh, um sort of um a bit of scuttlebutt as they call it in uh, at the excel center recently where james fisher were uh, had a big a big stand and um what they have developed which we're very excited about is this it's literally james bond stuff it's a it's a uh, vessel um, about I would say ten meters long, and it can deploy up to eight um, operatives in it, uh, and it has no magnetic signature. And essentially, the um, it can go thirty knots on the sea, like like literally speeding like anything. And then on it, top or underneath it, on top. Okay. It's 30 knots on top. So that's 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 fast. That's, okay. That's, and that's... and it's and it's basically hasn't got a magnetic signature, so it's not detectable by radar. Yes. And then it can also go semi-submerged and fully submerged as well. Um so for deploying operatives yeah. into missions, very good. Now there's an urgent operational requirement. That's actually a technical for, uh kind of acronym in the US State Department that they need this sort yeah. of vessel. And we understand them that they are doing um, cold water tests in Sweden and warm water tests in Miami. Um, that 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 uh, vessel sh- will cost several million dollars per vessel. And um, for those that like their army and um, action films, um, there are actually there are fifty uh, SEAL teams in the US. The operational requirement for each team, it, for a team that has these, would be three. And we understand from some parts of our due diligence that it is possible that these are going to be designated expendable, um, rather, uh, which is different than disposable. Yeah. But it basically means you can blow it up at the end of the mission or leave it behind if you <laughs> if you need to. You don't have to sort of save it, um, yeah, sort of okay. thing, which is also quite good for the old uh, repeat order business if they start using yeah. these things. Anyway, it's quite they they that that mm. so a combination of product development like that, um, uh, maybe one of these 
big ones they've had in a while. They've been talking to various navies about for a while drop drops in and defense should move back to that decent, decent margin. Now, the energy bit, it was 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 sort of used to be uh, well, the marine bit used to be helped with um, the oil and gas industry. And indeed, decommissioning is going to be a very big thing for, for James Fisher over the next the next next 50, the next 50, 50 mm -hmm. years. But they also do, um, they've taken their skill sets about um, servicing and maintaining um, um, oil wells. And they're taking that to, guess what? Yeah, the offshore wind turbine market, which, yeah. as we know, is is proliferating like any, like anything and uh, has a load of some very similar kind of kind of requirements. And they've been growing worldwide in their, in, in, yeah. in their contract wins there they have one particular technology which is fascinating where they, it's exclusive to them it's very high margin and it's becoming almost sort of um you know they have to have it because yeah. of the client's uh esg requirements it's a bubble uh like a bubble wrap this is by the way this is richard staveley's uh yeah, okay yeah there. yeah people bubble that wrap. make it will be absolutely horrified about how i'm <laughs> describing it now but basically it's a bubble wrap that you put around an oil well or a or indeed a, a wind turbine mm. and it it's um helps all the marine life it basically oh, okay um sort of yeah. it protects the marine life helps them it's sort of permeable but not semi-permeable and it kind of like um that sort of thing they're using those to to put around them deploying deploying those um so um finally they've got these marine businesses and they're the one of the world leaders in what's called ship to ship transfers yeah. which is when um essentially the business called fender care but um again without trying to kind of be be too naughty about it but basically so dimitri's got a big cargo of oil and then and then um lusikov decides he wants to buy it off him because the price has changed or whatever like that so all of a sudden this cargo is owned by this guy and then what you need to do is you need to get the two boats massive boats together um without crashing them often at sea and then obviously you then yeah. connect them up and, and 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 transfer the cargo without blowing everyone to smithereens uh which obviously you want someone that has, that knows what they're doing and james fisher are uh, some world experts uh, experts in that uh, and that's a quite a solid sort of business yeah. that, that they have i mean how are they going to get the debt down by the way yes i wasn't avoiding the conversation sorry. The, the question sorry so 135 million of debt roughly like that as i just explained we think they can do 85 million of ebitda so that's already moving towards a ratio which if it got to that point whatever mm. but let's flip it around and say they've still got quite a few businesses in each division okay Let's say we just for argument's sake, Paul, we 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 lose 10 million of EBITDA in a disposal for six times mm. EBITDA. Yeah. James Fisher's average EBITDA multiple since 2010 is 10 times EBITDA. Everyone's forgotten about this because yeah. of where the business is, where the market mm. is, but it's always been valued very highly. It's a very good business. So let's say we lose 10 million of EBITDA for um 60 million quid of debt. Yeah. The 135 goes down to 75. We're now below one times EBITDA. My yeah. my target EBITDA falls from 85 to 75. Let's say I'm not even right on my 85 and go 70 million. Mm. And then we're but now we've not got a debt issue and and the business is stabilizing. What would be a fair EBITDA multiple for 70 million of, of EBITDA? Oh, yeah. Well, it might be, it could actually be itself six times, seven, eight times, nine times. It was 10 times before, mm. 10 times before. And obviously the market cap is currently... Um, uh, the market cap is about 140 mil. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> this thing, quite literally, if they get this right, yeah. should could easily three, four, five bag um, over the next... Um, and how, how much time would you give a turnaround like this or to restructure? Three to five it? years, we always... It's three to five years is our... Um, uh, is our time horizon no um, i know for your investment but yeah. until in you'd expect for a management team to sort of like you know start putting results out as in like you know i know when you did with with crest chick and you were you know inverted commas engaged very much there with you're on the board that was 12 months it took and you saw a big uh yeah the shareholders could see solid results afterwards yeah we, we next year fisher should be showing demonstrating its improvements pretty clearly yeah, okay. to everybody yeah and we 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 think that they um it's probably in john's interests to um dispose of something during the next 12 to 18 months as yeah. uh, as well it's as you say it's not the 
easiest environment for selling businesses but they've got some quite interesting things in there that are quite specialist and where where the likely buyers aren't too worried about what's going on in markets they're maybe very big companies that are in you know, things like marine energy and defense you've got some massive players like oh we're just we're just like that um so so we you know i think th these these market conditions and indeed the rockwood and our portfolio it's very much um we've been reseeding um, the portfolio with yeah. stuff where there's catalysts and people have changed quite a lot in the last 12 months. So we 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 feel we have to take we you know it's critical everyone has a medium term view, but that's where you'll make the most money by investing now on a three year view. If you see what I mean, that's yeah. not waiting for year two. Oh, I'll come back to that in two three years. It'll be you'll people will come back and go, oh gosh, I've missed it now. Um, mm. It's it's to invest now on a three to five year view is the key. Yeah. And just in terms of, obviously, you take on a lot of responsibility with all the heavy lifting and special situations there and bundling and restructuring and all. How should investors think about sort of the volatility in the Rockwood portfolio versus the very strong, as I mentioned, long term returns? Well, our actual stock volatility has been reasonably low. Mm. It's probably even, you know, slightly better than. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it is low. It is low. Um, mm. we, we, we find that. Um, We'll get the occasional thing wrong. Um, we find we tend to get the things wrong when they're smaller positions because we're still before we've got once yeah. they become quite a big position, they they tend to it's they've got to that point because we either know it's all going to happen through in terms of our thesis or it's performing well. We're not we're not we're not taking any profits and we're just running running our winners. You do get uh, volatility around things like, say, for instance, our largest holding, RM, which I think we did speak to yes. about every year ago. And, and just to give a sense of, you know, when we, from the off, I was explaining to you and any um, interested investors in Rockwood that... These do these do exam um, services as well as sort of distribution of educational material in the UK, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So they've got three divisions. One marks exams, a brilliant business, makes 20% margins marks the international baccalaureate exams the icaew exams and some gcse's and a levels one does supplies to schools has about over 100 million of sales and does everything from bespoke teaching aids and curriculum based quite high margin stuff through to crayons and toilet rolls and then the third, um, literally and then the third and the third division is sort of a tech um tech outsourcing or offering to schools um, so sort of sticky contracts, public sector, um, so sort of okay, high single digit type margins business. Uh, they've got a few other little bits and bobs hidden in that division, but mainly it does um, sort of, you know, it'll do the IT for a collection of five or six schools in a trust. And that business got itself um it did a huge ERP software yeah. system that went wrong. That gave us the opportunity to be watching for some time. We started buying at 26 million market cap, averaged in higher than that. And then it went, and then people realized it wasn't quite as bad as it was. And it performed really quite well. At that point that we started buying, there was a huge amount to do. And that was about a year ago. Yeah. And this is why this is really about how Rock could invest and how how we how you investors in Rockwood or investors in RM should think about things. We at that point we identified we thought the business would worth between 160 and 180 million pounds. Okay. And essentially that that um when when it started to sell off some bits and bobs to pay down the debt in that first six to nine months, people realized, oh right, oh right, you know, and the stock went and ran up to 80p. Now we didn't sell a single share. Because we think it's going to go to 160, 180 on a three to five year view. Now, one could say, well, why don't you sell them at 80 and buy them back when they, you know, for things that, you know, but it's just not how we behave. So the volatility, to answer your question, is that's what we've got 10% of the portfolio in RM. It went up to 80. And then guess what? In the first year of the turnaround, they go one part of the, the supplies of it isn't quite recovering quite as quickly as we initially thought. Everything else is fine, but that business is not quite coming through. So we need to just temper uh, profit profit forecasts for the current year. But we're interested in where it's going to be three years from now. So that's sort of quite rightly up, you know, um, the market stock was weak. It's back down to like 50 million. Now. Yeah. That we're awaiting from RM. A conclusion to their strategic um kind of they, this is what they said in their, yeah. in their interims their strategic think thinking um we we've had unbelievable amount of catalysts now in place for rm so we've since we bought we've now got mark cook's gone in as ceo proven transformation guy we've got a brand new finance director ex private equity 
Chris Humphreys proposed by us to the board and supported by other shareholders and the board uh, by in a normal process has joined the board. He was a former CEO of Anite Group, which mm. was broken up, which yeah, was um, IT and services, which he was a, he bro broke up and built uh, and, and sold off and sold to private equity. He's gone on to the board. Mark is then at the next level down. He's changed the um, uh, um, director on the uh, tech uh, tech business. He's hired a full time transformation director that he's worked with before in private equity. There's a new head of digital, which was sorely needed, and a new head of real estate, which sounds like what's that all about? But there is some interesting real estate aspects to RM because it's also been around for a number of, number of years. It's not quite as well managed for shareholder values you, you would hope so quite a lot of change has, has, has gone on they they we hope that they will conclude uh, which is what we've been arguing to them and anyone that will listen is is that the best thing for our own shareholders is for the business to um essentially in a sensible fashion uh, break up the business yeah so sell each div division over the next three to five years and improve them along the way if they think improvement the first division though should pay down quite a lot of the debt at rm yeah yeah so yeah just gonna like say because that's, the, that's thing. the biggest thing isn't it i think they've yeah. got to talk to some banks and get that refinance if, have yeah. they broken some covenant as well or something i don't even they've know. got they've had full waivers uh full waivers yeah, okay. today the thing for here to remember again, this is the thing. It's a bit like James Fisher being around for over a hundred years and having a big charity as yeah. a shareholder. RM supplies ninety percent of primary schools. Do you mm. want to be the bank that pulls the plug on RM? Well, you do if you think they're idiots, but the reality yeah. is they're not. They're very they're, they're a cash generative business and have been for many many years. And they've got assets. They've got interesting businesses. I'm sure a plan will have been shared with the back banks about how they get their money back and why they should just be supportive in the, at, at this at the at this at this stage. And that's what we believe is the is the case there. They also in the, in the need for full disclosure. They also because they've been around years do have a reasonably large pension scheme. Mm. Um, but and the deficit was a real sort of you know I, I don't know what that phrase is but you know around the neck thing I mean it really was yeah. quite a big problem for them a few years ago but with changes to uh, both the money they've put in mortality interest rates all the rest of it that deficit we think is coming right in and is moving into the zone of where it might be able to be resolved in fact uh, either as part of one of the disposals or even potentially we'd like to see the company considering a buyout with maybe some of the cash that comes in so that you can like uh, fully buy out the scheme yeah. it's no longer an issue and then maybe the first the first or the first and the one and a half of sales one and a half divisions of sales take out all the debt, take out all the pension, leaving you with a couple of the, the best businesses for the next three to eventually monetize value from that. That's kind of where our thinking is. And we, we, we we're we looking forward to seeing what the board concludes, but we think they've got some very bright people in there that we think are likely to, um, yeah. oh, my, Mr. Kirkus, by the way, is, um, it's funny this, but it turns out that his LTIP um, okay. only makes serious money at uh, 160 million okay. plus valuation, which actually is kind of what we think it could be worth. So, <laughs> so that's quite funny, <laughs> given that we said that do well was before it? he was awarded it. So. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because uh, old Charlie Munger's got that. Um, he's got that sort of saying, I think, uh, if you want to know what the outcome is, tell me what the incentive scheme is. <laughs> yes yeah you know it's just very good good old charlie <laughs> i know now one you mentioned before um which you i don't think you've had to do too much heavy lifting because it's really sort of like exact done exactly what the it said on the tin or what you told me is galliford try in infrastructure really really cheap seems to have a lot of sort of like when it measures itself average net cash so it's got a strong balance sheet huge orders and I, and i guess actually if uh, if jeremy hunt at the old orkham budget on wednesday decides he wants to juice the economy then infrastructure is going to be the place yes yeah Calford is 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 definitely a beneficiary of our massive infrastructure spending deficit that we have in this in in this country um and you're right we haven't had to do much heavy lifting it's fair to say if i had to do the amount of lifting i've been doing in pressure tech and a couple of other of the holdings but across the whole portfolio you i wouldn't be on this interview yeah uh, we need a few more stables i think <laughs> yes exactly exactly but we do create the portfolio to be like that and yeah. this is what we call one of our kind of opportunity stocks where we're not seeking to take a big notifiable say state 
become a catalyst, get stuck in. This is one that we just think we're just going to we're going to sweat our capital in a more liquid stock. And as you can see, it's one of the higher market caps yeah. in the, in the, in the portfolio and pretty liquid, helped by its buyback camp uh, um, that has been it's had in place. Um, we have, but despite all of that, I couldn't help myself, Paul. So we did actually engage with the company and wrote letters to the board with regards to their dividend policy. And this was one where we didn't have enough um, stock to sort of potentially sort of wave a stick at them. We just had to use our kind of, you know, our sort of um, influential, you know, our skills of argument and all the rest of it. And Galliford have recently announced an improvement in their dividend um, policy, which they only announced last year. Um, so we engaged them and it was two times cover. And the reason is, is that we... We're looking, they've got this, so Galliford's market cap, what have you got? Have you got it there right now? It's, yeah, I have, yeah. It's probably about a 240 mil, but they've got uh, average cash for about 135. That's right. So, so 135 million of average cash, spot cash is near, yeah. near a 200, but they're, they're, they're very um, uh, appropriately guide investors not to think they've got 200 mm -hmm. cash of their, of their own. So you've got 135 million of cash of their own. That's a good starting place for not getting into trouble as an infrastructure business. Uh, I think it was debt that killed Carillion, wasn't it, in, in, yeah. in the end? And then secondly, they've got this PFI portfolio of, of, mm -hmm. of assets, um, which is worth about 46 million quid as well. So that gets you to 191. And how much more do we have to explain away now? Oh, 50 million of the rest of the value of the business. Yeah. For that, you get 1.4 billion of sales um and quite a lot of EBIT, quite a lot of EBIT, EBITDA but the, the the PFI piece that actually produces a very a very interesting income stream to Galliford Galliford try yes um, um which is inflation linked long term um and pretty juicy so but whenever they met investors investors would quite rightly say they'd say oh we've got these 46 million quid of mm. thing and then you, you, you quite rightly would say well we can't really see the value in that you know, why don't you do something we we'll show investors the value how do we get our value as, as shareholders and they would go oh we don't really want you know it's quite important so so I so I we wrote to them and said, well, we've got an idea. Why don't you you don't need two times dividend cover on, you know, totally yeah. contracted long term inflation linked income stream. So you could actually be more aggressive on your dividend cover on the income stream from the PFI portfolio uh, and, and, and and drop your cover a bit to cover that. So that's what they've done. Jack the divvy. So it's still now yielding just under five percent on my last on my last numbers growing as well that that dividend. Um, they did a special because they won yeah. some sort of cases. Um, that would be the mindset of this management team and board, which is fantastic. It's buybacks, it's give specials, it's increasing dividend. I mean, it's they're doing all the. This is the. This is what we want all our boards and company management teams yeah. to be thinking about: how do you maximise uh, share shareholder value? They've on the corporate front. What they've done, which I think is not particularly well understood, is what everyone thinks when they think Galliford, if they know it a bit, is they think schools and hospitals, which is mm. what their mainstay is. You know, average job, 20 million, a primary school, an extension, a sports hall, a, you know, a, 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 an NHS unit. And there were experts alongside Keir, the other regional player around the UK, building those kind of jobs good solid and remember it's a budget there's lots of industries next year where the budget's going to come down mm. yeah schools and hospitals it might not fly away but they're going to keep building schools and hospitals in this in this country that's all fine that's what everyone thinks about with Galliford but actually they very cleverly built quite an exciting water business oh, okay and, um, yeah they, and they, they actually yeah. serve all of the water companies now and they've done it a bit through bolt-ons and also their own ex expertise and, you know, all your listeners will be well aware that the, the water industry's infrastructure is now come under a big lens of, you know, uh, of uh, concern. And um, the next, they, they call them AMP. There are these cycles. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's about AMP 8, 7 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The next one is going up by more than yeah. any of the others have done, like to major, major, uh, yeah. to billions and billions. And they are, in, you know, Galliford are in a very strong position to pick up a lot of work uh, linked to that regulated market rather than. So that's how investors should think about it. It's still looking super cheap. Yeah. Uh, as we just discussed on the sum of the parts basis, even on the multiples, it's, it's looking cheap. And the only other thing I would say that I, um, is that some of your invest investors will um, I, 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 I will um, 
not have received their investors chronicle on time this weekend i didn't um and i know i'm sure that i think there was a problem with the investors chronicle go digital richard i i get it i get it online mate there is nothing better, Paul, than than reading the Investors Chronicle with a small with a glass of Burgundy in front of a log fire on a Sunday afternoon. If you want to make money on Monday morning, uh, that's all I can say. True. So okay, in yeah. that, I've, I have done an article or work with one of the journalists there who, to, yeah. about, about Galliford. So yeah, okay. Um, yeah uh, okay. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's very cheap. It pays a good income, and it seems to have a solid balance sheet. And I would now, even though I'm hesitant to say it, I would put it into the sort of sleep at bed type stock. And contractors never were that over since since the Carillion day. So uh, just moving into the same sector, infrastructure, Van L. Now this one has been less straight line, one up, you know, go, going up to the right. It's sort of like it's a it's one of the I think it's the UK's number one uh, ground piling geotechnics business and basically helps sort of like infrastructure to put foundations in but it's big into rail i know that and with hs it was into hs2 but there's obviously a lot of electrification elsewhere and i think it's sort of like softened off a bit in the new build uh, residential housing you want to take us through your latest because this is a significantly smaller business but does it have a decent balance sheet eight million of net cash yes yes yeah so for now, as you rightly say, market leader um, in foundations, the largest player in, in, in the UK. And um, it's got some cyclical aspects to it, which, as mm. you said, which is the housing. And we suspect that's been a little bit tricky, they're not a little bit, but actually probably just straight tricky for them uh, yeah. this year. But fortunately, they do have um, a number of contracts in, um, in rail, uh, and the order, order books have been quite exciting in rail. Um, they also, it's weird, uh, there's, there's quite an interesting contract that they they believe they're plugged into in relation to smart motorways. Now, you've probably read that yeah, smart yeah. motorways aren't happening, but there's actually quite a lot of work still linked to the actual smart road motorways yeah. that needs to be done. Uh, and they, they this, like road sidings and things like that, that they, they're also uh, um, partly exposed to. Um, the business has been um, improved materially uh, over the last few years by Mark Cutler, the yeah. um, C CEO there. And their technology in rail is actually quite, it's, they, you know, it's, it's more than market leader. It's almost yeah. like the others can't do it at all. Mm. And that's why they've actually just been started to win some business in Canada. Now, it's, it's, you know, what on earth's going on, Rich? But, you know, they basically, if you think about, you know the rail industry there's a lot of rail in in, in canada uk rail at you know they're they're a leader in the technology on the rail space we, you know so they they've started to win some work in canada which might be quite an interesting growth opportunity opportunity for them now more interestingly they they have very recently announced a, a transaction with gallifers <laughs> yes they have actually yeah, right yeah. yeah good point um now i don't know i i i think it was coincidental but it can't have been unhelpful that um that the chairman of van l is the former finance director of galliford oh, okay uh, so um he probably did look at the business they they bought and essentially what's happening some of the some of the large construction businesses um have their own piling uh kit and divisions which they use to service their contracts but they don't and maybe a little bit of external work but not not very much and, and most con big contractors either do that or they use uh, the, the van Els, or they're not big enough to have have their own thing and it's kind of that kind of model they it, it, it as, as far as i understand it what's happened is gallifer have sold um van L, their kit mm -hmm. for doing that activity uh, that uh, the activity it's actually a slightly slightly different technique they get in in piling world there are all these different sort of yeah. techniques of what you do and there's there's this called rock and alluvium which is what the galifers main, main guys are doing that that um um looks ostensibly not particularly exciting because it looked like it's sort of break-even business the business that they bought they haven't paid too much for it but i think it's going to that they expect the management team expect it to have quite an impact actually over the medium term in terms of winning more work from Galliford, which is obviously a huge business relative to uh Van L, tying the links in and also um they the ability to kind of cross sell other services that Van L do that mm -hmm. wouldn't have gone into a Galliford deal that they wouldn't have gone access to so there's quite a lot of quite interesting strategic thinking and finally regionally um it's in the south and southeast and Van L do work obviously down uh, in the south southeast but Van L's historically been more a northern 
uh, Midlands, Northern and, and Scotland uh, uh, um, bit, um, business. So it's on a low vert multiple. Um, we, we think they, um, we've been encouraging them to think ambitiously at Van Al, uh, with regards to um, the next stage of their growth, their growth. If, if they can't, they, they really do need to come up with something ambitious to sort of break out of being, of being small. The margins have got some more improvement to do. So I think yeah. officially set <clears throat> to 8% margins, currently about five and a half. So there's a bit more profit recovery without turnover growth. Um, that's probably all, that's probably, you know, the view there for us, it's, it plays the infrastructure. It's, it's, it's performed well compared to average aim. And since we bought it, um, not shot the lights out, we've got a bit decent profit. Yeah, no, I would agree. Definitely. They're good, solid businesses that have been around for ages. And, uh, you yeah, say they sleep, should be relatively sleep at, 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 at calmly at night type stocks. Now, they're all sort of benefiting with the ones we've gone through, all benefiting from secular growth. Now, there's one you've got STV, which is a sort of like a, it, you know, it, it's a it's a TV advert, well, sorry, it's, it's a TV broadcaster in Scotland, and it does traditional linear telly, and which is obviously come through your aerial, and then does over the top stuff, video on demand and digital, and I think it has its own sort of like um, studios as well, specialist studios. Take can you take us through this one because linear telly, you know. Is just it's is really really struggling unless it's got something unique. It's 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 probably the advertisers are not going to go there long term. Yeah. So, um, STV fascinating situation. Been around a long time. Mm. If you if you can get if you're old if you're old enough, you can remember that they they that when they sort of privatized ITV, there were a range of kind of like regional and otherwise TV companies. Yeah. Essentially, they all got consolidated into ITV, apart from Ulster TV, which was bought by yeah. Liberty Media and was listed a number of years ago, maybe at least 10 years ago, leaving mm. the only other one being S, being STV, yeah. which importantly is the number one broadcaster in Scotland. Like hands down, the number one news show in Scotland, if you want to advertise to anyone and get them, is the STV News at, at six. Equally for drama, uh, num number number one in Scotland. There is apparently a bit of a cultural thing is that quite a few of the Scots see the BBC as being English. For them. Yeah, okay. And so uh, STV is seen as being the national uh, a national broad broadcaster. Um, now that's been the heritage is obviously linear and very, very difficult. Mm. Now there is an interesting piece here about cyclicality. The broadcast profitability, the broadcast, they call that broadcast. Mm. Broadcast is likely to be down 50% this year. That's how cyclical um, that kind of activity in, in line with uh, ITV or actually slightly better than ITV. And in fact, the channel has been outperforming ITV and they have a link long term agreement with ITV to show their content in STV plus their own plus their own their own content content. So that so in relation to broadcast, which I'd accept is a at at best a sort of very slow declining kind of um it's like uh, print media isn't it broadcast it's well it's well this is the thing so hidden in there is the following i know you're looking as skeptical as you've ever i am before. yeah sorry i well, am okay, now. so in there they own they they have this thing called stv player and you you, you yes now that would player. be that would well that'll, that'll work yeah so let's just pretend nothing else exists i'm about to talk about at stv yeah okay this year the STV player is going to do uh, roughly 10 million of sales yep. and make 5 million of profit. Yeah, that does not surprise me massively. It's a 50% margin business. Now, yeah. if I came and said I'm floating a business that's grown every single year for the last few years, it's now at 10 million of sales, making 50% profit. Um, what multiple will you put that on? Well, you have, have to put the content over. on it as well, mm -hmm. though. It's, it's got unique content, hasn't it? You can't it's got it a mix just... Of yeah, it's a mix of unique content and their yeah. own content, and it, and, but it's also what, what's what's the trick in here? We're not trick, but what, what what's why it's interesting is because people sign up to there's five million registered users for it. People are using the, the player more to watch TV when when they want. But what happens is you become you can then target that person when they do catch up on mm. on um, agreed Brookside or yeah. whatever yeah. it is, whatever it is that they, that they want to watch. So that's very valuable advertising, which is why they're why they're um, it's very very pro pro profitable activity. So we think that's very profitable. The broadcast actually, although you could argue it's it, it's still it's still if you want the biggest number of hits um, to advertise to the people of Scotland, 
then you would still advertise on uh, um, on, on broadcast and STV. And a number of their shows are the number one mm-hmm. you know shows. They now this is where we get onto um, their creative side. So they've always done stuff. They've always had a kind of production unit to create their own content. Taggart, uh, yeah. all the back office episodes of Taggart are ST- STV owned. And believe it or not, Catchphrase is one of their. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. as well, and I know you're a big fan of celebrity catchphrase, Paul, but that. that, that um, <laughs> Funny that, you should say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they're on series 10 of celebrity catchphrase currently. Um, <laughs> and that's that, that I can tell you, that it doesn't take anyone much time to work out. That's a highly profitable, yeah. profitable TV format. Uh, you think about the costs involved in running yeah. catchphrase. So so they, they do this, but they've been building that up. Now, this year, that activity, the creative side, is likely to be 50% of all the profits at STV. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so what SCV is is not a, it, it's it has got a challenged broadcast, but it's mm. at a cyclical low yeah. broadcast business. But they've also got a d- dynamic digital business, and they've got a growing um, creative business. And content is what everyone wants now. And mm. they just they only a couple of weeks ago they announced they just got a got a big commission from America for a new reality show that they've developed yeah. called The Underdog which is about um, social media stuff. They, they're um, a lot of their dramas. You'd be surprised what they make and what they've been doing, but some fantastic, if you go, if you, if people look, look, look onto their website, you'll see they're creating a lot of very popular yeah. content, um, which you can get. Shouldn't, shouldn't they be bought by ITV? I mean, you know, the Sydney well, would be down enormous. Let's get tax. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, they should. And if they, but they, it's not necessarily just ITV. There are potentially yeah. other strategic buyers that would be interested interested in it. Maybe maybe a content player that wants the content, but also wouldn't mind a bit of broadcast. Now, there's two 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 key factors around that should be that are relevant to this. Well, three actually. The first is they their contract to run it in Scotland runs out um, at the end of this year and or shortly. And then the new 10-year contract gets let in Q1 next year. Now, I would be amazed. I'll come back here, you know, wearing a silly hat, if uh, Dunce's hat, if they don't get renewed it. But when, yeah. but it's important that, that if you think about how lawyers' brains think, so I would suggest it's important that yeah. they have that contract in place for the next 10 years, number one. Uh, number two, Simon Pitts, who's been doing the sorting out of STV, has done a really, really good job. Uh, was formerly his brilliant um, CEO, in my opinion, uh, and he was formerly head of digital and a serious um, um, MD at ITV. And I think he he was sort of possibly in the running, should we say, before um, D- uh, Diane McCall, I think, it was, yeah, uh, who, who is the CEO yeah. of ITV, became, and he left shortly after her appointment to, to do the STV STV yeah. job. So he knows what I, ITV I, I, extremely well. I mentioned Liberty had bought Ulster. There's a range of other people, but the business itself is also <coughs> highly cash generative. Yeah. And I don't think, I think it's easy to be very negative on broadcast, but uh, it, it's still very, very popular uh, if you look at their stats. Um, mm. um, so, you know, their digital side seems to be really growing, doesn't it? I mean, that's their, you know, that that's the, the lifeblood, the studios. The creation and the actual, you know, digital side is is, yeah. is where the value lies. I think is probably yeah. fair to say. Got a little bit of debt, but not too much. They've yeah. got seventy million of facilities debt, about thirty million. They have also got a pension fund issue, like our, our RM yeah. that needs to be resolved. But the larger companies probably not too, mm. you know, will think about that, or that will be reflected in the multiple. But um, it highly cash generative business, STV. Yeah. Now another one, MMC Sarge. We've spoken to about it a couple of times. You've now got a rock star, sort of like uh, internet real estate chairman uh, Zilla Bing Thorne. I think is the uh, is the person in the chair there. So uh, this the, presumably the direction is going to be up for uh, MMC because it it did have two bids, didn't it? When you first sort of like um, you know yeah. when, it, when you first mentioned it, I think it was next fifteen, and um, it was a private equity one by um, uh, Vin, Vin Maria. Vin Maria, yeah, yeah, yeah. So MC Sarchi, everyone will know global global advertising yeah. business, um, uh, very strong brand uh, around around the world. Had those two bids that were rejected quite rightly yeah. by shareholders. 
uh, Harwood, we think we think MC Sarchi's worth uh, three pounds a share, just yeah. to keep it simple. For and it's one thirty now. Yeah, it's one thirty. So everyone's like, oh, we should have stepped the bid at two twenty, but we, you know, we think we'll yeah. get back to more than that in the in the end. It's yeah. come back to one one twenty, which is absolutely ludicrous. So yeah. the business is net cash. Yeah, uh, it'll have less net cash than it had, even though it's been cash generative because they've been buying out a number of the minorities. So the way they or within yes. the group. So what they used to do was someone would set up a kind of like like MC Sarchi Philippines yeah. and own a minority stake. And they've been cleaning that all up so that we yeah. own all the earnings going forward, which is the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so but there'll still be net cash. Uh, we're expecting after that after that process, but we'll own all the uh, all the earnings or nearly all the early uh, earnings of of the company. The company um, remains highly cash, highly cash generative, and the advertising piece is obviously a bit like STV. Advertise the adver- more advertising exposed areas, particularly their creative agency, uh, has been under pressure during during this year. And about midway through the year, they actually had to bring down num- and bring down numbers a bit around about the time Zilla became, um, ex- well, just after uh, she became uh, exec chair. Now, the business. Um, the business is is still misunderstood. Why I say that is because this year, the creative advertising agencies, which is what everyone thinks of when they think MC Saatchi, just subliminally mm-hmm. in their name, that's actually only about 25% of profits at MC Saatchi now. The, the significant amount of profits are in other things other than the creative a- agency. In particular, they have they are the you know one of the world leaders in kind of strategic communications. And they have contracts with the State Department, uh, well, essentially into the State Department via someone else, I think, for a range of security reasons. They have the British government, Australian government, NATO, World Health, Health Organization, the UN, um, and that sort of stuff is very profitable, very good lines of business, but clearly counter, counter cyclical. They also have do a lot in what they call passions, which is basically everything from um, like the Barclays Premiership yeah. to um, to Coca Cola for the Olympics. Obviously, got an Olympics coming up, and, and that sort of thing. And they, um, which are again, aren't really linked to the same sort of tempo of creative advertising mm. uh work that will come that gets that gets pulled back in a in a in a downturn like we've been seeing the lot in the last 12 months the bi- the business what what we what we think's happened is so Maureen McClellan who was the who who was one of the who was the younger member of the four founders of MC yeah. Slarchy many years ago was the perfect uh, transition candidate after those four members had to really sort of leave the business because they lost control of MC Slarchy price collapsed yeah. that's when we got stuck in at Rockwood and bought our initial stock um, Vin uh, I'm sorry not Vin um, Moray became the CEO. Uh, and a good transitional candidate, really, because he knew everyone there. Um, he wasn't going to sort of, and, and but he also knew things. He was interested in new, uh, new broom from that perspective. But he's very much an advertising guy, not necessarily a cost-cutting sort of turnaround kind of guy. And they've established there are material cost savings at yeah. MC Saatchi. It's not difficult to think through with this um, federated structure of. Philippines MNC Saatchi and Singapore MNC Saatchi and stuff like that. They but they're allow- they were allowing those guys to get on with the job. As a result, you've got sort of finance departments all yeah. over the place, yeah. and they really just need to do this kind of move to one shared sort of mm. facility. And, and that's the simplistically what they're going to do. But yeah. Zilla is going to crack on with it. So she she th- there is material amount of profit uh, growth that can come through just from the cost co- cutting um, uh, initiatives that they are undertaking right now it also in the creative agency piece uh, we understand that um there are some actually some very good businesses that are still doing fine this year but again it's it's a portfolio of creative agencies and there are a couple for, i think one in asia for instance that's just loss making and it and there just needs to be some hard decisions done zilla as you mentioned bit of a rock star uh very very focused and she will just make the hard decisions and move it on now What's critical here is we come back to what we were talking about, bid for bid fours at tw- 220. Now, Vin Murray still owns a stake, big stake, PA, personally, and also in her 
vehicle which it, mm. uh, i i call a spac but apparently yeah it doesn't like being called a bit being called a spac <laughs> but they they and but they between them they got about 22 percent of the portfolio she knows the share price is still completely wrong at, at the current at the current level um but she also knows you know um so we expect her to be we expect her and it is we we expect her to be supportive of zilla and zilla's initiatives however we suspect if Zilla can't deliver for shareholders over the next a much shorter time horizon than normal now, I mean, it's within our yeah. uh, Rockwood horizon of when we first bought the shares, but now we're into the life. In the next 18 months, if Zilla can't um, deliver um, much, much more improved um, margins, sort out the portfolio, get this all sort of pulled together, get the stock re-rated quite rightly as it, it should do, then we think, you know, the game, the game is, the game will be afoot again. And we suspect it won't just be sleepy at MNC Saatchi. So we are, we've been buying more all this year. Um, and, you know, and it's, and, and actually delighted to be able to pay the yeah. £1.25 for MNC Saatchi shares. It's literally, it's on, again, it's on an EV bit dar about, four and a half times yeah it is yeah yeah and, and just to go back to what we were saying it's the same with one of the you know what is ebitda you know what's the point the point is is that cash profits e yeah it's cash profits it's how private equity think about it. it's how private owners think about businesses but the ebitda bit is the is you know is the cash profit before the other bits yeah. but again net cash interest yeah. income tax losses quite a lot of them yeah. uh and then the depreciation uh and stuff is the um it's you know linked to capital expenditure well we as we as as we all know it, you know the only capital expenditure in advertising business as i can see is like how many martinis they have at the end of the you know so <laughs> not sure i wasn't accounting you know how to capitalize that exactly. <laughs> i've tried i've tried it yeah. uh, no i haven't um, <laughs> no i mean i would i would point to um, investors that uh, if somebody like zilla has decided to become the chairman. You can guarantee she just she doesn't want to be doing this just for cost cuttings. This, she's got a big plan there to really, you know, to create significant shareholder value as she did at Future. So yeah, I think you've done brilliantly, or somebody's done brilliantly to attract her to uh, it, Chairman C. Sharcher. It's a very. It should be a reminder, although it's quite big for small caps. So well over two hundred million of, of sales in in their, across their activities. In the in the big world of advertising, it's still seen as quite a medium yeah. size, even not even medium, like a high end small size agency, which yeah. is also interesting in a kind of global context. The, just the final thing, it has not been helpful to have yeah. Martin Sorrell's uh yeah, exactly, in S4 and yeah. so yeah. people are kind of read crossing the rating a bit yeah. to other advertising agencies. And I think that's a um I think people are very careful about doing that about what's going They're on two totally different businesses moment. no yeah. doubt about it now just finally on the media side b2b centaur media as you briefly mentioned swag Mukherjee, he's the ceo there been there a few times as like for some years in a turnaround they've 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 hit the nail on the head with the terms of meeting their margins but um i guess because of the digital advertising market it's been a bit soft this year it's sort of taken some out that some of the juice off the top line well, I just just um, just state up front, we, we know we're very large. Oh, of course, yeah, yes, yeah, we're very large shareholders in in uh, at Harwood in Central Media. In fact, across Harwood funds, including Rockwood, we own twenty nine point nine percent of the of the company. Uh, we literally cannot own it, uh, any more shares. Um, and secondly, I'm a uh, non executive director of, of of Central Media, so I just need to be very careful about uh, about how yeah. I talk about the company. Um, the wh where are where are we? Well, Centaur, you know, it had seven divisions. Uh, it's now had just two for for a little bit, for a bit. And with those two under Swag and the team uh, there, they have improved the profitability you know, very markedly. Literally, margins were five percent three yeah. years ago, and market forecasts for this year are for them to be at twenty three percent margins, having done just over twenty percent margins. Like, EBITDA margins. EBITDA yeah. margins. Yeah, twenty percent EBITDA margins. Which like. is what he's flagged for some time. That was his sort of like his target to get to a steady state, wasn't it? Yeah, he has. He has. So, so it, um, if the company achieves its targets for this year, um, the mat it's called Management Action Plan twenty three will have been you know completed, and they're very much focused on on delivering that. Uh, following that completion, you've then got, you know, investors, I'm sure, are all thinking, well, that, you know, what next? And and the reality is they're in, you know, they're in a good position because 
they've still got we 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 were very active to um sort of promote that they should give special dividends to yeah. investors uh, a year uh, earlier this year and and the company did do did do that uh, but despite that with all the cash generation they're still i think again market expectations are for the company to have 10 11 million pounds of cash yeah. by the, by the end of this yeah. year um so so it's a, it's got a lot of it's going to have a lot of cash which has got means it's got a lot of options to think about what the best thing is for shareholders with that and then it's got these two um, businesses, um, which are now making much more, um, I would say, uh, impressive, normal, or kind of best, even potentially sort of almost best in class levels of profit, profit margins. Um, so we then move to maybe you can move the pro profit margins, maybe a bit higher, or maybe you can't. And the tr tr trick is to just try and keep them where they are. So it's it's about growth uh, and growing both both divisions. Now the lawyer is obviously just an iconic brand, uh, mm. and they've been for lawyers, for lawyers, for lawyers. <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, yeah. But you've got to. You, I mean, if you, I again, if you can find a lawyer that doesn't read it, you yeah. tell him, but don't employ him if he doesn't read it, because yeah. he, he clearly, or he or she, because yeah. you do need to read the lawyer if you're a lawyer, yeah. and it's all subscription. It's highly profitable. Yeah. They've been developing quite clever, um, sort of offshoots of it with some more specialized advice or information which they then can charge a bit more for they have a lawyer awards which is where every you know if you want to that's the one you want to get if you want to make partner yeah. that kind of thing um so so um uh, they do that as well um and it and it has and it has been um steadily steadily growing there are a little bit of cyclical elements in there as you would imagine so we need to be we all need to be conscious of that but but um but essentially um they've consistently been able to sort of incrementally grow that grow that quite niche business that niche uh, brand if we go to the marketing division this is um it took me some time and it to, to really understand what was going on in this division and and it is quite difficult to communicate it I, I i think or at least i find it slightly difficult to communicate but in essence it's it's media services to marketing people so uh that so think the chief marketing officer you know where at unilever or wherever uh, they've basically got a number of things to try and uh help him now that's a mix of events so they have probably the industry leading event called festival of marketing where all the cmos will hang mm -hmm. you know uh hang uh, turn up to and they're you know the the would-be cmos the um, the deputies will want to go to and they own marketing week which tells yeah. all the cmos what's going on in the industry and and they also have this business called e-consultancy which which actually helps cmos improve their departments learn the latest tricks do better at digital uh, digital marketing but what they also have which has been really very important during this yeah. map 23 period is this thing called mini mba yeah and this marketing is marketing mba isn't it yeah it's a little diamond hiding yeah. hiding in sense it was not really hiding but it's it's mm. quite it's a very important business within that division and that has been growing steadily it's an online course where you get an accredited degree an mba sorry in marketing it's run by a very very charismatic guy called john ritson uh mark ritson sorry mark ritson who's kind of extremely well known in the marketing world and um, you you chart it's chart it's cost a few grand, and people like Unilever, for instance, yeah. go like, well, <laughs> twenty of you, everyone in the department has to do it if they haven't done it already. Equally, um, you know, you or me, if we're in the marketing department, go right, and we, we're not being paid for, we might go, well, I might get a better job if I do that, or get promoted, or whatever. So I might even pay for it my, myself um, to to get that MBA. And that's been growing very fast, but it's also very high drop through margin, as you can imagine, yeah. because it's just, you know, it's the same. It's a one to many model, isn't it? Yeah, one to yeah, yeah. So that we think they created a lot of value with that. And that mm. could, the potential there is true. <laughs> Could be enormous. Could be enormous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not that their, their, their target market could be much bigger than where they are. Equally, there are all kinds of sort of offshoots or other things that you could do around the brand and all the rest of it that, that could be um, could be developed over time. That takes effort, capital, uh, application, sales, all this sort of stuff. So they've done a great job with that so far. But I, I would say that's a real exciting piece. So Centaur now. Let's just get back to where we are with Centaur. It's absolutely ludicrous. UK stock market, completely broken, uh, as usual. Um, highly profitable business, expected to deliver lots of profits with a very, with an absolute bulletproof balance sheet. I mean, yeah. 
you know, we, we mentioned how silly the prices of James Fisher are earlier because mm-hmm. they've got debt. Once the debt's gone, they'll they'll go up. You know, this has got loads of cash mm-hmm. and it's still on forecast EV, but I mean, you tell me it's better that way around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's about eight times, basically. No, no, wrong, completely wrong. Oh. Your numbers are wrong. It's because it's it's forecast to do it ten million of EBITDA this year. Yeah, it is and totally wrong. You're right. Sorry, it is. Yeah, absolutely. It's about four point seven. Yes, that's where we're. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That, yes. That's a. I've got a calculation error in my model. Yeah. So this is so <laughs> don't worry. No, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, um. So so four point seven times on on that. Yeah. On the right number. Yeah. Um. With cash. And yeah. remember, we you know we go back to. I'm standing like a broken record now, but the I is income. Uh, yeah. They've got some tax losses. There's, there's not. It's not highly capital intensive. Mm. I mean, if you think about it, you know, it's the kind of business again. You know, if you just, you know, you and I, if we, if we just club together and got all our mates and we just like, you know, it, you, you in, in, a, in not, in not very many years, all the money that you borrow to own Central Media would, you know, you could pay back, and then you'd own the lawyer for the rest of our lives. And yeah, we're just, yeah. you know be drinking martinis with the MNC Saatchi guys yeah. you know the, now that's just a way of thinking about all stocks so it's like how many years of cash flow would it take me to buy back this whole business if I owned it and MC and an MC Saatchi's one it wouldn't take very long with MC Saatchi it wouldn't take very long with with Centaur and a number of the other Rockwood, Rock, Rockwood holdings they're just yeah. the stock market isn't choosing to value them like external parties are yeah. Now, on that note, I mean, it's like you keep asking me about stocks, but I just want to mention, I want, do want to mention, um, you know, we've had some fantastic takeovers um, yeah. in the last few fin- weeks. Finsbury Food and City Pub Group last week. Yeah, City Pub Group last week, 67% <clears throat> premium to three-month average. Really mm. pleased with that. We've nailed a really good IRR on that. Finsbury Food was a, we're a bit disappointed with the premium, 22% premium, but we've actually made... Uh, nearly 40% IRR on our investment in, in that. We also had uh, wonderfully, um, one of the other opportunity stocks uh, was uh, on the market.com. Oh, yeah. Uh, massive premium um, to, um, to to the market um, price and the three month three month average, nearly, nearly 100% premium to three month average well done. on the market. Um, and we also um, were saved, um, uh, not through. With Seraphine. No, no, that was last year's save. This okay. year's save was smooth, smooth, oh, smooth. Yeah, finally, okay. uh, which we managed to, in the end generate a small return for yeah. um, for Rockwood shareholders. But having again had to roll up our sleeves a bit to get yeah. that um, get that um, resolved, should we say, is the best way. But delighted that that came in again. The big came in at sixty seven percent premium to the price earlier early, earlier this year. So um, we actually. Um, We've got this weird thing. It's weird. I'm super excited, as I said at the start of this call, about like um, the um, um, returns that can be made from mm-hmm. here in UK small cap and the returns in Rockwood. Um, I'm actually down to less than 1% cash this morning in wow. Rockwood because I've now got 27% of the portfolio under takeover offer. <laughs> so you should have a lot of cash it's january february next year so yeah so by mid-january next year um we just want we ideally we'd like the market just to remain still a bit cautious until middle of january but uh we will be uh there's so much still on offer out there it's a buyer's market so we'll be we won't be sitting on loads of cash for long i can tell you that yeah Yeah. well you should get yourself a a bridging loan then until that cash comes in and you can start deploying it earlier (laughs) just to guess funny you should say that (laughs) okay (laughs) sorry (laughs) <laughs> now um you've got you, you obviously they've gone through some stocks which are doing a lot of self-help and hopefully not too much lifting heavy lifting from you guys but you have got one in there host more which was a spin out originally from private equity about two years ago really sort of fell off the uh the wheels fell off the bus it does tgi fridays as a franchisee in the uk and i used to love the name tgi fridays you know cocktails and all the gimmick that used to throw cocktails around the place and all this was fantastic atmosphere but now the reality is that it's a, it's a pretty competitive area this casual dining what sort of attracted you to uh to tgi fridays basically in the uk i think um maybe unsurprisingly it was the ludicrous valuation that's been placed <laughs> on the brand okay i mean i mean you just can't sometimes i just can't help myself because it's just so crazy what's going on mm. so 
you're right. It's still TGI Fridays is the fourth most uh, highly recognized casual dining brand in the UK. Yeah. And the three above it are all pizza brands. So it's still yeah. the, it's the number one most recognized casual dining brand outside three pizza brands. It's uh, they've got just over 80 uh, units. Mm-hmm. Um, we all know it. It, it, yeah. it. it reaches a wide demographic. A lot of people still go there for um, after work drinks, you know, something not too expensive, but it's Doreen's birthday. So mm. let's get down there and celebrate or, you know, Peter's retiring. Let's just go. Let's go and have a few cocktails. Their, their go to offer currently, I understand, is £12 for two cocktails, which okay. is you know, great, great value. I would yeah. suggest, suggest. And then they've also got this other more broader market where they do the, um, you know, the family market where mm. you're you know you're taking the girls to see barbie and you know you can you can um you know put alongside that a knickerbocker glory and a burger at, at tgi yeah. at tgi fridays it's historically always been profitable the the backdrop's been very tricky as you might imagine mm. um so the backdrop's tr- and remains tricky for those kind of businesses um and as a result backdrop tricky um and um, the stock market's just not interested. They're also partly not interested because no one's really heard of them. Because as you quite rightly said, it was a demerger out of the Electra Investment Trust. And often what happens with demergers is, is that, unless they're large cap ones, is that um, when you do an IPO, all the small cap managers are like super excited to go and see a new company or whatever. So you get to go and see everyone. And, you know, half of them all say, no, not on my Nelly. I'm not going anywhere, anywhere but thanks very much. And, and, you know, they've got the file notes on the company. The mm-hmm. other half go, we love it. And maybe, and it gets, and it gets, it gets IPO'd. In a demerger, there's no real reason why anyone has to go and find out about host malls. So there's not a huge amount of investor education that's been done on the business. Now, it did delist, as I think, I may have got this wrong, but I think it delisted at about a pound a share. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, in the summer, it got down to 13p a share. And there are, there are, if my memory serves me correctly, off the top of my head, I think there's about 100 million shares in issue. So it's quite an easy one from a market cap. Yeah, 126, about. I know, okay, 126 million shares in issue. So the market cap's not, it's not miles away if you're just mm. trying to do it quickly in your, in your head. About from, 25 mil. Yeah, so 25 million market market cap now. Now it's back up yeah. to about 19p and about 13 million, uh, 30 million of debt. Yeah. So it's leveraged. So 55 million of of, of EV. Now the the the... What's happened is the it's called Host Mall because the former management team were plan was to use the prolific cash flows from the quite mature TGI's brand, mm. quite mature but not fully mature brand, only eighty uh, restaurants, and use that cash to host more. I they were on, they were like banging around trying to find you know mini wangabangers to buy and yeah, other okay. sorts of, uh, groups and sort of create a restaurant group kel surprise the first management team that's you know love the idea of being giving a checkbook to go and buy lots of businesses yeah yeah, so, yeah and and it turns out that actually um that probably was not the time of it, 2023 was probably not the year to be um focusing on kind of expanding the group but possibly just on getting the knit getting the knitting right yeah, uh, yeah. with the actual store estate so what's happened is that Stephen Welker mm. has become a uh, chair. Yeah. Now, Stephen um, is one of the brightest people I've ever met. And I have an bu- amazing job where I get to meet hundreds yeah. of people that are bright all the time. Stephen is super, super bright. He was basically, he he was the number two to a chap called Ed Branson at Sherburn. Mm. Sherburn Investment. Yeah, I remember, yeah. Who who are kind of a US activist guys who play oh, the equity the, guys, yeah. Yeah, and activists. they play in the UK. Mm. They turned around and got F and C uh asset management sold. Mm. They turn around Spirant two times yeah. ago. I think someone needs to do that again now, but like they they, yeah, I know. they did turn it around and got it sold, made a load of money. Uh and then they fell foul of two or three other things they did extremely well. Um they did but they did fall foul of an attempt to have a go at Barclays. Mm. Where they called out Jed Staley amongst other people, and but the great and the good told told Ed to sort of you know stop fiddling around in our in our mainstream bank. So he didn't win that one, but they may yeah. may have been right actually. But they 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 so he, uh, Stephen was his number two, mm. very bright guy. He's now exec chair, and he and some kind of like his kind of kind of associates have, have taken a quite a big stake and quite quite a, quite a lot of the stock. Um, he's got stuck in. 
and uh, we've had a CEO change, new CEO, new finance director. Mm. And they, he's also done two things. He's gone uh, gone to the Americans and asked them if we could have a pause on new openings. It's a franchise. They yeah. own the UK brand. And under the franchise arrangements, you have yeah, to open okay. a certain number. But yeah. a new TFIs is about nearly, you know, it's between one and a half and two million quid. Yeah. You don't get your money back for some, for some time. Yeah. So when things are tough, you don't really want to be opening two million pound sites with a view of making some yeah. making two million pound back over, you know, three years or whatever it is. So he they've agreed to allow him to pause that, number one. He also went to the banks and asked them to just sort of just give him some breathing space, which they've agreed to. He's re-engaged with the banks actually right now. So we'll see how where that lands. Mm where that lands but what they've been absolutely um categoric about is that they believe that the business should at least be able to get itself to a 10 million pounds of free cash flow a year yeah and they've also been categoric that that money will all then be available for shareholders yeah so even although we've made a decent return already now it in this um at 25 million market cap once the debt has been paid down to a normalized level or it's a sustainable level which i would suggest is somewhere between zero and ten yeah you know, um we'll get back 10 million pounds a year in free cash flow yeah and i don't know what free cash flow yield you want to put on 10 million yeah, well, I'll just I'll just work it out as a, like if you've got even if you before you've paid the debt back, it's sort of like you know if you do ten million on fifty five, I mean it's, it's you fifteen twenty percent as of today is your cash yeah. flow yield as if as long as they can do ten million exactly. So if they can do ten, that's, if they yeah. can do ten, they can get it. So we we could look. Well, I think I you know we could be looking at a four or five bagger from here still, and and that's not you know the, the business has got over two hundred million of sales, yeah. uh, well known brand. It's yeah. got you know it's. You know, so this is not this is not trying to reinvent the wheel, really. Yeah. So he's got to create a vibe, but I think he needs to, as in, like you know, they need to get a local communities involved and wanting to go, and it becomes a, a sort of like a must-have destination. I think. Yes, well, they, they they're absolutely, and the new um, CEO um, is very much an operator yeah. who's kind of really she is a lady, and she's very much got stuck in. They're doing one thing I quite like is that they think it's quite fun is they they've realised. They've spun it around. You know, our experiential things are really kind of a big, yeah. quite a big theme for quite a lot of investors. So they've they've caught onto that. So they're doing like cocktail making masterclasses mm. for not very much money, and you can go with your mates and you spend a little bit more money to do cocktail masterclass. But then you're all you know making that yeah, and yeah, yeah. for the rest of the evening. So that's a sort of simple type thing they weren't doing before that they really mm. they really they really should be doing. So um, yeah, so that's like we um, it's just finishing on host more i mean finishing on on talking about host more it's the most risky position in the portfolio yeah okay. without a shadow of a doubt not that it's super super risky but in terms of risk reward where we gauge the whole portfolio yeah. it's the one that's got the most risk but we think the likelihood that it or the chance that it has to four or five bag mm. uh, relative to that risk we we invested two percent of Rockwood into it. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. If we're successful, we literally will still own it when it's eight percent of the portfolio and gone yeah, okay. up four or five times. So, yeah. Well, if I say if they get the mojo back and introduce that trademark uh, cocktail juggling, which they used to do back in the eighties, then they'll bring uh, they bring the crowds back in. Um, now, just turning to some industrials, Filtronic. Now, this is one which has sort of like been around for ages. And um, it seems to have won some pretty amazing deals of late, actually, low Earth orbit sort of contracts, defense contracts, and also with the European Space Agency. It does sort of like, I think it's telecommunication type um, products and stuff. Do you want to take us through this one? Because it's certainly something that I looked at years ago, but I've really sort of like, I haven't, I haven't really run the slider all over of late. Yeah. Okay. I absolutely love to, actually. And um, you're right. <laughs> It feels like Rockwood today. It's a little bit like um, it's like for antiques roadshow, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> St. James Fisher, 175 years old. Ho Ho TGI Fridays from the nine from the, from the 1980s. Precious yeah. Chesterfield Cylinders is over 100, 100 yeah, years old. Yeah, yeah. Galliford's been around since the 1800s. Yeah, I mean, it's like Scottish TV's been around. Like, so there is. You might. Uh, joking aside, we really do like businesses that have been around. For some time, yeah, yeah. Everyone's heritage. Forgot, everyone's forgotten about, and mm. then and and and, and things are changing. But there's some stuff yeah. in there. What Filtronic um, has got uh, after their long history is 
it's got an expertise and know-how and some actual IP in radio frequency um, technology. Mm. So this is um, on a global scale, like literally they're one of the only independent players left in the in the world uh, who have really high skill sets um, in RF. And um, it's, but it's become very small. It was the legacy of what they used to have that they all had to get, get, mm. sell off. It's got um, three main um, uh, end markets. Yeah. Um, the first is telecommunications, where and the way RF is involved, we think fiber for our broadband uh, in the ground, but for somewhere like India, that doesn't really work. Yeah. So they have to have masts. So mm. for 5G, so the client we understand from our kind of interpretation of the commentary from the company and the, where they are and other work you can see that we think that um like nokia who are the world leaders are yeah. using them in, in india and we, we we're aware they're working with the world leaders for 5g yeah, okay. in telcos they're perceived by the world leaders to be the best and they do that yeah. now the telco market is a bit soft and they flagged that and that's the only yeah. risk in the filtronic it's um, tough as well yeah it's tough so it's the only area of risk within the thesis right now mm. but they have got those contracts it's also lower margin so mm. it's it's not the big it's not the most important profit contributor they think they, they make about gross margins about 35 to 40 percent okay in, that's not bad profit. it's not bad it's not bad but um but when we get on to defense mm. defense margins are up in 60 plus so yeah, in defense okay. they do stuff like they are um um they're in the r radar for in the nose cone of the of the typhoon yeah okay uh, and that's we're talking of Eurofighter typhoon. Eurofighter yeah Eurofighter typhoon <laughs> not yeah. not a cup of tea <laughs> no 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 not typhoon no, no, yes yes yeah yeah we haven't no yes yeah yeah so it and th that's going through an upgrade at the moment so uh and they they make so they are mis they're kind of super security qualified yeah. um you know no chinese visitors sort of thing huge barriers yeah. to entry on that huge one huge barriers to entry they've been there for a long time and again top top quality clients best clients in defense leonardo uh yeah. bae and they say again quite niche but quite high margin yeah. and that's going quite well now those two are fine it's all right um except they don't add up to huge amounts of sales they add up to some sales but not huge they also have a legacy um cash cow business which is mature where they do the it's called critical comms and it's the states is the is the is the customer and motorola is the customer okay. we, we believe in the states and this is the guys this is first responder oh so, okay is, so again rf yeah. this is the old market for RF. Yeah, i know yeah because you can't use your phone because as we all know when we go to the yeah. go to a sporting event you can't bloody use the phone and everyone wants yeah. to use it so after a crisis it doesn't work so the guys need their and they they basically are in the main the number yeah, one okay. selling uh, contract there. That's a bit of a cash cow business yeah. for them. That all adds up to some sales, but not quite enough. And mm. wouldn't be exciting enough for an investment thesis for Rockwood on, on that on it alone. Um, uh, so the final piece is all the excitement or potential excitement, which is essentially for space mm. and for the satellite industry. And, and what's happened is Elon Musk has essentially yeah. changed the economics of space mm. simple as that before it cost god knows how much to get anything up into space yeah but his re-entry rocket uh systems at spacex are basically changing the economics of, of space and as a result you can um do a lot more launches and they it's developing up this what's called low earth orbiting yeah. satellite in starlink industry. Starlink is the Musk owned one. Uh, yeah. We we'll call them Le we'll call it Leo from now on to keep it simple. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Low Earth orbiting. So Leo. So yeah. and so the G. If you think of if you if you say you're at space and you look at the Earth like yeah. this, the GPS system that the, 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 they're off the off the you can't see yeah. the picture now, which is I've done that on purpose. They're out yeah. here for the GPS. Starlink is like around the Earth like like this, yeah. much lower Earth orbit, and and as a result, thousands of them in his constellation. Mm. But he doesn't have a monopoly on doing these constellations, yeah. and there's a range of other people that want to put these up. Mm. And what it's allowing is obviously is very fast uh, internet access direct to satellite. What they are finding though is is that the demands and the data demands are pretty uh, are even more significant than they expected. Mm. 
which means you have to go up the wavelength. Uh, yeah, we go okay. back to physics GCSE here. Yeah. And guess who are the experts as you get higher up the wavelength yeah. uh, of stuff? Yes, it's Filtronic. Yeah. So uh, Filtronic have stated they're working with a leading US player in the low earth orbiting okay. satellite uh, industry, uh, but without ever quoting the name of the customer. Yeah, okay. um, they have also, um, but what we, what we can tell from the announcements they've made is, is that Earlier this year, they I think it was yeah, earlier this year, they um, won a contract to develop um, a solution for 20 ground stations. Mm. Um, now, it's we would kind of do diligence in this and we, we found out that like the um, one of the major constellations that's that's up already has got 40 ground stations. Yeah. Um, and um, but and has but has a. A, a kind of culture where they like to see if they can do things in-house as well mm. so we we believe that like half the ground stations were given to an in-house team and half were given to an external to give it to filtronic to try and develop and it does appear that after that that process has gone on that filtronic solution is sort of um delivering what the client wants mm. um they have since then there's been some critical announcements where it's been announced that the European Space Agency have given them a, a, a special grant funding, which again is 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 interesting because we again we think that that is the European Space Agency works to help um, businesses like Filtronic develop the tech where there's mm. an actual commercial solution, not necessarily that you pay space agency wants, but they know the, the the industry wants or whatever. So we think Filtronic is in a phase of growing serious strategic value in the satellite industry we also think that the sales that you could generate they could potentially generate if they've got their their kind of amplifiers or their tra or, mm. or other uh, pieces of, of kit that they they could build in in both what they what they all refer to as the payload which yeah. i get really annoyed about because that that just means the satellite i yeah. just why can't you say satellite rather yeah. than payload? Go, if we get into the payload yeah. but anyway so the payload this could be many, 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 many satellites, thousands and mm. thousands and thousands of satellites. This, this is the kind of so. What you've got is, is you've got a company that's got ex very strong positioning IP globally, that where a brand new market is just opening up, mm. and it looks like they they might be in perfect position to give solutions to enable that industry to to, to do. Now there are lots of players in the satellite industry. Yeah. There also could be potentially quite a lot of sales, which comes back to Filtronic, which ostensibly looks quite high multiple at the moment. Mm. But you only need a few million quid of like yeah. um, you know decent margin stuff into the into the uh, space industry, and you get that full public listed and overhead kind of recovery operational gearing point. So basically, they're making just about enough money from the, the critical comms, defense, and telco, all of which look reasonable apart from the telco at the moment in terms of how those industries are performing. But that should that allows to produce a bit of EBITDA, you know, one and a half, two million a year kind of thing. But if if Leo starts to go 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 big for them, you could add on quite a lot of sales, and that's all going to drop to the bottom line, or a huge amount of it would drop to yeah. the bottom line. <laughs> and EBITDA would go exponential. And the value of the business would 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 mm. would would, um, would would change would change. How much how much recurring revenue do they have? Because that was always their Achilles heel. Basically, they got large lumpy contracts 10, 15 years ago, and it was always difficult to get recurring services off the back of it. Yeah, the um, I don't know the answer to that question actually off the top of my head. What I do know is that I see that the critical infrastructure stuff is kind of like it's like on maintenance schedules, and there's yeah. a amount every year. So that's pretty stable uh, activity. Defense, uh, defense has been a, a bit lumpy, but again, they're on some big long-term contracts. The Typhoon one is like huge because of like the number of planes that are yeah. uh, d uh, deployed. And then I think telcos has been more definitely been a bit more lumpy. Yeah. But I don't think the thing is, I'm as an investor, I'm relatively relaxed with the kind of. Um, I sort of almost mentally, I don't think the shares are going to really move around depending on that from from hit, from kind of here on in, mm -hmm. depending on exactly how those other businesses are performing. As long as they're not going, you know, down the toilet, as long as they're just sort of OK yeah. or they, they can be a bit lumpy. It's mm -hmm. really about what's happening with Leo. And that's what should drive the share price. And we hopefully there'll be lots of news flow in the next 12 to 15 months. From yeah. The company. I would agree. No, it's an exciting one, that one. I never really appreciated the space angle, which uh, that, I mean, that low, 
Yeah. No, net I mean, cash. Oh, they got loaded. I think they got 17 million of tax losses still. Yeah. On net cash. Yeah. Uh, they're up in Sedgefield, Tony Blair's constituency. Oh, okay. Right. I might um, take a visit then. Yeah. <laughs> Is it? And I, I think what's it's worth going up to see them. I, I'd add it's we're aware on the business part where they are. There's another small cap called Chromec, which is on the on. on oh the, yeah, yeah. Um, which we're not invested in, and but also there's um, uh, we understand Lockheed. Oh okay, are right. Looking to um, set themselves up on that, uh, on that, on that on business that. part. Okay, well you never know. Yeah, Lockheed, get... Lockheed have a range of interests yeah. in in defence and space and things yeah. like that. So. We can't, um, we, um, and I think they need to, under various rules, Lockheed needs to have a bit more exposure uh, or, or activities in the yeah. UK in order to win work from oh, the okay. UK. All right, fine. Okay, well, we'll just go for the one last one, which I know he's got the hallmarks of uh, Rockwell. He's uh, Restore, which basically has been through a few wobbles of recently. It does uh, physical storage and archiving of documents, which is their bread and butter business, high margins. And then they sort of like digressed into digital, I think, which is basically PDF documentation and storing it in a big sort of like on a server, which is sort of like the wheels have come off a bit on that one. Do you want to take us through this one? Because as I say, it looks a solid business and probably a bit of a turnaround uh, magic wand is required. Yeah, sure. Okay, so Restore, um, I mean, this is... I'm very excited. Well, it sounds like I'm excited about everything, but I am genuinely excited. I'm very excited. <laughs> We've only just started buying it. We bought it. We started buying it one. I can't believe it got down to one pound thirty-five. We started yeah, at one pound yeah. thirty-five. It's two quid a share. So immediately, all your listeners are going to say, "Oh, I've missed that one." But you, you, ha you haven't missed it. <laughs> and the reason why you haven't missed it is, is that they, um, the business was run. It, it's it just out of it. It's also an AIM IHT stock. Yeah, okay. So it's worth worth be, being aware of that. Uh, so Charles Skinner, who's one of the most intuitive business people I've met, mm. um, just just courses through his veins. He became CEO of Restore in 2009 mm. um, and was CEO from 2009 to 19, 10 years, and basically took the market cap from not very much to a few hundred million quid worth, uh, worth yeah. and basically built the strategy with great and but he's not a because he's an intuitive businessman he doesn't really like faff nonsense committees um all that sort of thing he's into well, he's the perfect guy for rockwood then exactly yes exactly yeah he's 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 basically impact he's 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 into empowering people and making money for people for people yeah. which is what he what he did he he left the business in 2019 i, I probably don't want to be drawn into why or wherefores but it's fair to say that the board had evolved a bit mm. uh, going into um into the latter stages of his tenure and we're starting to ask him to do all sorts of things that um you know in relation to the business that he probably wasn't that keen on doing um so he decided to to leave um now for normally for rockwood stocks we got when we bring someone in um, they are kind of proven, reliable turnaround guys. So mm. if you take Mike England, at, yeah. um, who's who's gone into flow tech, tech, fluid, fluid yeah. power. Uh, if you take Zilla, Zilla has gone into uh, MNC Saatchi, uh, Jean Vernet, uh, James uh, James Fisher. Um, these are all um, proven, but it does take them, you know, six to twelve months to you know find out where the loos are meet dave in the office and yeah. generally just sort of work out what you know what's doing so they they but because they kind of know what they're doing they typically hit the ground running mm. so which is which is which is good um charles who's just been reappointed ceo of restore is going to hit the ground sprinting mm. um i mean he is going to be moving at serious pace uh, because he knows everybody he knows on the business back back to front and what is he coming back to? Well, the core business is still bloody fantastic. Mm. Um, it basically it's it's and it's seventy percent of the, this is the this is the physical archiving business. This is physical documents, which yeah. everyone goes, well, that doesn't exist anymore, but it does because government mm. departments and medical records, yeah. and all sorts of legal stuff are all um, NHS, um, you know, all need lots of written stuff kept for a kept for ages, but. For the vast majority of the boxes they have, 22 million of them. Oh, right. <laughs> 22 million of them now. They do two things. They collect dust and cash. 
yeah. and that's basically each morning they just wake up in the morning in the box and it just takes some more money and gives it to us as not a bad business to have it's an amazing <laughs> business now charles because he's so clever yeah. um when he was building the business he actually bought um he bought 22 nuclear bomber bunkers off um off the americans who uh, when the cold war was sort mm. of ending and we didn't need nuclear bombers anymore i'm not sure whether maybe sell them back these are time. bomb shelters bomb shelters yeah, yeah bomb not shelters. bombers bomb no, shelters. No, not the bombers no bomb shelters Jesus, god, my god sorry I was, bomb say, shelters. I was thinking wow is he got he he'll get yeah. sectioned if he's not careful no 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 bomb shelters bomb shelters which are obviously quite well protected yeah um, but don't also have a particularly long list of secondary uses Yes. Um, so, so the, the the price of them isn't that wasn't that expensive. So, guess where all the boxes are stored yeah, now? It's so, a bit of a USP uh, that one, isn't it? You yeah, can't really yeah. sort of re replicate that one. Yeah. So they've got so they've got these boxes. Box growth has been a bit of an obsession of the recent management team, but really, um, so the, the end industry is probably flat to very small growth at best. It's not in decline, which is interesting, um, but flat to very to slightly small small growth. What is the case is that Iron Mountain or the other player and Restore yeah. between the two of them make up about 70% of the market. Mm -hmm. And um, and as a result, um, it's, it's it's good conditions for a stable and robust pricing environment, should we say. Yeah, okay. So um, And a lot of the clients are very sticky. It's quite expensive to move the boxes around. Um, so they, you know, they, 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 and that's, so that business makes over 30% profit margins, mm. come back to our rule on the yeah, EV okay. sales versus operating margin. That's 70% of, of yeah. the business. There's not much CapEx either, I guess. Not much CapEx, <laughs> bit of racking once in a bit, maybe yeah, a new okay. I, I get it. fire system. And then Jeff, who just sits outside, making sure no one breaks yeah, it, okay. that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, so, so it's very good business. Um, Charles started them on the on the road to uh, diversification and made some good good inroads, particularly in shredding, which was quite hard work for him early on. Because yeah. in shredding, you need um you need like any kind of transport business, you need yeah. enough this act scale to have root mm. density so that you make the right profits. But they've actually got that now. And then the number two in the UK, shred it is number one. But again, yeah. quite consolidated market, but a good business feeds in nicely with um with the boxes so you know mm. and but what really happens is harrow green which is their other division which was the founding division which was um is an office removal office relocation business it um you obviously move your offices for whatever reason more recently maybe because you're thinking we don't need as much office space mm. but then that move creates a requirement because you go oh no look what's in the bloody cupboard or look yeah the end of my desk what should we do with all of this and then they basically need a solution and then they may go oh can we shred uh, shred some of them send some of them off for long-term storage because we legally have to because we have to keep the records for a certain number of years that sort of thing some of them might go well can we scan those and digitally scan them that might make a bit of sense um and also at that point you might go when we move to the new offices we'll get new computers so we need to get rid of all our computers and that's the technology uh, service that they do where they take away um, um computers and you mm. know destroy the hard drives and all that sort of stuff <laughs> they've been winning that because in those services pieces they've become built a very strong track record and they're winning amazing contracts they won one the other day for hmrc mm. for digitalizing the hmrc um records um they're um they you know and um, so it's sort of virtuous, but I think what was happening is, although there's obvious cross-selling synergies, it's actually quite difficult. You just want a little bit more of nudging at the sides and have people run the business. So that um, Charles, who's just come back in, has explained to everyone any last week that the plan is to have these MDs. He's changed two of them of his each mm. each business, and it's kind of he's giving them their business key objectives and then allowing them to just crack on and uh, and run it. He. He told me, he told me he when he left, he when he left Restore in 2019, there were six people at a uh, head office. Mm. And he returned and there were 56. Okay. Well, so um, there's a bit Spanish. of cost saving you can do there. Yeah. Yeah. The balance sheet's solid. Um, and now it's on uh, like six times, just over six times EBITDA, yeah. um, maybe eleven and a half times. 
Now, remember the that's eleven and a half times a depressed level of profitability because they had a few kind of temporary um, issues which he'll which he'll iron on out. Some which were slightly external, like the paper price uh, has come back and they sell they make money from the shredded paper that from which they yeah. sell, they sell on. The mill price has been low, not their fault, but so there's a bit of cyclicality to that. But um, up restores average PE for the last eight, fif- fifteen years or longer, so it doesn't just include. Um, kind of qe related high multiples yeah. is is not is 19 is 19 times yeah uh, and he thinks that um he thinks uh you know eps growth can be could be quite material from here combination of pricing mm. better run less costs more entrepreneurialism and um and it's pretty much as simple as simple as that so you, you um we, you know, we we think it. Um, we think this could. It, you know, it was only four quid a share. I think it was. Have you got the share price? There? No, I haven't. No, but it was like... literally only four quid a share, like about yeah. a, a year ago. Yeah. And now you've got Charles running it. I mean, you know, so for those that go, oh, I missed it. It was one thirty-five. Now it's two quid. You know, mm-hmm. wrong. It's going to keep. It's going <clears> to <throat> keep motoring, and it's a pretty low risk turnaround. For uh, you would suggest. Yeah, well, I mean, he, he's done it before, hasn't he? He knows all the levers to pull. And um, it it doesn't take a sort of like a you know rocket science if you've got the right management team and the right business and, and there's nothing fundamentally changed over the last four years other than they went through a, they they did a couple of things they which which, which they're going to reverse then uh, yeah you should get back to where they were. I okay. think what was most I think what was one in the meeting he had with investors last week one of the most encouraging things I think was that the previous team were running um, it during the should we call it the heady days of growth. Yeah. Uh, where not where a number of shareholders, should we say, were also encouraging all their companies that growth was the only thing that counted and they mm. should grow or whatever. And maybe boards were feeling the pressures for that. And should we say that at the end of last cycle, or for at least a few years at the end of last cycle, the hurdle for a sensible acquisitions may have dropped at a few companies yeah, around okay. around the yeah. stock market. <clears throat> so the, the the long and short of it is, we think that the um, the uh, growth will start to come the growth will start to come through and um uh, now but not from takeovers yeah so okay. he's organic going to, not, he's going to organic growth only yeah, yeah. yeah brilliant okay well just a last thing to pick your brains what's sort of like the thing to investors should avoid doing given this backdrop i mean i'm guessing given what we've just talked about it's, it's to be too cautious <laughs> the danger is if you go small cap is be too cautious at the moment but anything else that people should sort of like you know watch out for yeah, I think I think number one, and I've mentioned it already in this today, is is that if you're taking on a business with some leverage now, you need to be mm. that that's going to be the highest risk holdings for you. Yeah, Doesn't okay. mean you shouldn't, but you need to be really comfortable about how they're going to get paid. Have they got the wherewithal to pay that debt down from either their own cash generation or disposals? If it's sort of oh, maybe they'll raise it from somewhere else, or the banks will give them more time, or if it's only that that might not work for you. And then you could end up with very significant dilution. That, I think that's number one. I think number two, the biggest other trap at the moment, or biggest other potential risk is investors that are still slightly kind of um, harking back to some of the growth, the multiples put on growth stocks in the last cycle. We don't think this market um, um, recovery and the next phase is going to be similar. Mm. So, I think investors need to be careful about what kind of target multiples they have for certain businesses, um, um, which um, were clearly overvalued in the last cycle because interest rates were zero. This recovery won't be interest rates going back to zero. It should be interest rates going back to three, three and a half or something like that. Maybe maybe, maybe we have to get used to four even, but uh, it, it, um, it won't be one or zero. And a lot of stocks were priced for that. So not, oh, I bought it at this. It used to be this price, but that was on, a, that was on the wrong the wrong end. And I think from us, I mean, we one of the lessons we've learned um, or I've definitely learned in the in the last 18 months with one of our holdings is we you need to do your work on do your work on um, who are the share, who are the main shareholders. Are the main shareholders going to be an impediment to value a realization? Are they? I know, be- I know which stock you're talking about, but I won't mention no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly, don't, don't, don't. don't. No, exactly. 
but I, you know, what I would suggest is invest in the, but what I would suggest is that if you see uh, Harwood on a register and, we're, and we've got a decent stake, then hopefully we've shown enough evidence across the various Harwood funds, including Rockwood, that we're trying to work on behalf of everyone to, yeah. you know, uh, unlock, realize, recover or, or generate shareholder value. Yeah, no, I mean, I would totally agree with that approach. I think, uh, and, and I was, I've been investing for 30 years and I've been an investor alongside Hirewood just by coincidence on a number of occasions. And uh, I, I'm absolutely delighted whenever I see you guys on the share register because I know if it does, if, if it goes to a temporary problem, you guys pull your sleeves up, get involved, and uh, as you say, you're active, where well, you basically engage with management to uh, to make sure the wheels go back on. So uh, a, a big pat on the back. Thanks very much, Richard. Now, if people want to invest in um, in in the Rockwood Strategic, uh, how best to do that? It's obviously an investment trust, isn't it? Yeah, we are we are absolutely listed. So, uh, we are listed on the main mar- premium listing on the main market of the stock mm. market. You know, bid offer spread. We're about one eighty p to today. We're up slightly year to date, which is please you know which is not an amazing return it's fair to say but i think aims down about 14 percent as we yeah. as we speak so you just buy it buy it buy it in your buy it in your sip like i've got it in my sip for the long term mm-hmm. i've got a big holding i bought just under one and a half percent of the company christopher mills has bought um 28 of the company mm-hmm. uh, we're, we're long-term shareholders we'd like long-term shareholders to join us uh, you know uh, that's the best way to do it stick in your, stick it in your eyes so you're not going to get much income from us i have to say we might pay a little divvy but it won't be much so don't it's all about the you know the overall overall capital growth over the medium long term yeah. if some of our uh, holdings are kind of you just think well that's just all too too racy then do exactly what what we offer you know it, rockwood is a diversified exposure to these stocks where we mm. you know what we're doing but we can take out the risk for individual investors by having a few rockwood alongside their other uh, other other holdings um uh, that's 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 the best thing to do if you want more information our website www.rockwoodstrategic.co.uk loads of information presentations fact sheets uh how we do it uh, the process, portfolio construction. We've got some links to some of the stocks. And, mm. and yeah, so um, I think we've got a link to Vox Markets, actually. Okay, well, good. I might have a look myself then. Fantastic. Well, <laughs> we have put one in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've certainly set a high bar for everybody to meet, that's for sure, because having hit the uh, the top of the charts on the last three, five, and one year. So a uh, big pat on the back there, uh, Richard, and uh, look forward in, uh, in touching base in six months' time. That'd be great. Thank you very much, Paul. And thanks everyone who's been listening in.